Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Today's my last day on the road away from my recording studio. I'll return tomorrow to release a brand new weekly market recap video with Lance Roberts. For today though, we'll replay the detailed webinar on retirement planning we released earlier with the personal finance team from Real Investment Advice. It's one of the most valuable, practical, free videos Wealthion has yet produced. This is a channel dedicated to wealth building after all, so let's get right to it. All right, we're live. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back to what is normally my weekly market recap with Lance Roberts. Um, but uh, having polled this audience in past weeks, uh, Lance had mentioned that his organization, his team there at Real Investment Advisors, uh, that they have uh, specialists that provide a really in-depth um, set of best practices around retirement planning. We polled you, the wealthy on audience, if you wanted to see their presentation, overwhelming response that folks wanted to. So what we're going to do today is we're going to uh, introduce you to Danny Ratliff and Richard Rosso, uh, who work with Lance at Real Investment Advisors. They're going to go through their presentation. It's pretty meaty, folks. It's about an hour and 45 minutes. And then once that's done, uh, we'll all come back on and we'll take live Q&A from all of you. So thanks so much for joining us this Saturday. Just some quick uh, housekeeping before I bring the guys in. Um, uh, if you have to leave early uh, and don't get a chance to watch the full presentation, um, don't worry. Uh, the replay video of this event is going to be available immediately afterwards at the same place where you just found it. Um, and so uh, you'll be able to watch it and rewatch it to your heart's content. Um, so everybody will get a chance to watch this, whether you're watching live or not. Um, all right. Well, look, Lance, let me bring you in and you can uh, introduce the fellows on your team here. Yeah, good morning, Gad. So good, good to be here. Normally, we have so much to be talking about in terms of the markets and what's going on. And, you know, but as we've talked about before, you know, one of the more important things about, you know, investing, which is great, you know, managing money, investing, buying stocks and bonds is all great. But, you know, the important thing is having, you know, some type of financial direction of knowing what it is you're actually trying to achieve. And that's where, you know, um, I've worked with a lot of firms in the past. I've, I've built another firm uh, before I joined RA Advisors. And uh, one of the big reasons I joined RA is because they are very financially focused on financial planning and, and retirement and, and these type of things. And Richard Rosso, certified financial planner, Danny Ratliff, certified financial planner, two, two of the best planners I've ever, ever actually had the, the opportunity to work with. And uh, these guys really know a lot of things very in depth about retirement planning, social security maximization, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, you know, Roth IRA conversions, why you should, why you shouldn't. And, and, and there's so many things that you don't realize about financial planning that has a major impact on your financial income. You can invest all you want, right? But you can really mess up a lot of your retirement um, by making bad decisions, uh, retiring too early, taking Social Security too early, you know, tax taxation on your Social Security by still having income after retirement. There's so many things you can do where you wind up leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table. And that's what, you know, this kind of presentation will go into and what Danny and Richard will get into a lot of depth in is all these different various financial planning aspects that really will save you and make you money longer term. You're muted. You're muted. Adam, Adam you're muted. Here's the presentation, everybody. Yeah, exactly. So while Adam's muted and talking, we'll try to get him online. Okay, yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were talking to Rich that he was muted. Sorry, that was me. No. Um, sorry, folks. So anyways, there's Rich right there. Hey, Rich, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right. Your partner, uh, Danny Ratliff, will be joining us uh, hopefully after the presentation airs here. Um, and so we'll have you, Danny, and Lance uh, to answer everybody's uh, questions at the end of this. Uh, it's funny that I was on mute because my next note here was just to ask folks as tolerance as I still learn this new software that we're using to run uh, this webinar. Uh, hopefully everything's going to go well. But um, all right, folks. So real quick, um, if you make a comment under the video, uh, we're going to see it here. Um, so uh, as you guys, uh, as we get to the Q&A section, that's where you guys want to ask your questions. 
I'll pull as many as we can, um, do our best to get through as many as we can uh, in the time that we have available today. While we're getting started here, do me a favor, just uh, share with us where you're watching from. It's always good to know where our audience is coming in from. Um, and with that said, guys, I'm going to play the presentation here and then we'll all come on afterwards. All right. And let's uh, let's hope I can get this to work right. Hey guys, welcome to RIA Advisors Pre-Retirement Guide Inflation Edition. I'm Danny Ratliff here with Richard Rosso. Thank you so much for joining us today. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. We are Clarity Financial doing business as RIA Advisors, registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission as a registered investment advisor. Please do not construe any of this information as a specific recommendation. If you do have questions, thoughts, concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, realinvestmentadvice.com. That is realinvestmentadvice.com. So Rich, what's in this pre-retirement preparation guide? What can people expect to learn today? Well, this is an exclusive course on the new retirement mentality. Who will you be tomorrow? What's the game plan? So what we want to try to help you understand is to formulize a personalized right lane exit strategy and make a smooth transition to the next evolution of you. How to incorporate Social Security, right, Danny? That becomes a very confusing topic. How does that fit into your overall distribution planning? The right Medicare decision is crucial. And most important, if you think you're going to fall to the lowest tax bracket in retirement, you are wrong. So we want to look at how do you switch to a tax diversification mindset and save thousands of dollars in taxes throughout retirement. And then how do you rethink your investment portfolio five years before and after retirement? And most important, because we always say this at RIA, cash flow is the lifeblood of retirement. We want to help you understand how to generate a tax efficient retirement paycheck. Perfect. So we're going to talk about this plus five must see charts for retirement distributions. How do you look at distributions in retirement? Where should you be putting funds like Rich just alluded to? Uh, you know, how do you generate tax efficient distributions? Where do you accumulate? So how do you rethink housing and retirement impact of long term care? Do you need it? What do you expect? Um, comprehensive retirement plans, what that looks like and then buy and hold. Is that strategy flawed or have things changed? I think you're gonna you know how if you have followed us for any period of time, you know how we feel about that. And then inflation expectations is how persistent is it mm -hmm. how long does this go we're going to talk a little bit about that as well so rich you know talking about retirement that's changed for a lot of people so this chart yeah. we talk about what do you do for a living in retirement yeah i mean we hear all this talk about how the unemployment rates 3.6 percent but really you have to look at the labor force participation rate and after the the uh, the pandemic i mean it sort of fell out of bed and a lot of people retired uh, but most important, the trend since 2000 is this. Older people are staying in the workforce longer. We'll talk about why. And I also think that we saw older Americans leave the workforce, Danny, but we're seeing what we call the great unretirement. People are coming back due to inflation. They're coming back. They want to be social. They're coming back. So you have to think about this. You can be in retirement multiple decades and you have to think a client actually gave me this this line when he he said to me and i thought it was great what am i going to do for a living in retirement maybe it's how am i going to live in retirement and living is a lot more than money right there's a qualitative element that we're gonna we're gonna talk about here well we're you know there's so many it. issues that we're facing right now we do know that the consumers they're they're stretched i mean you have inflation that's hitting them higher interest rates are beginning to hit households as well and the problem is that we don't have the savings that people would historically have had to live off of so this chart shows how long people in their 50s could afford to live off their savings 20 percent could live less than one month 36 percent less than three months and a staggering 49 percent can live less than one year and now here at ria we talk about not only having emergency reserve funds but also a financial vulnerability cushion to give you a little bit more of a buffer between you and, and events that may occur. So this is really important. We're going to stress some of these things throughout this uh, web webinar today. And, you know, talking about the definition of retirement changing, like you mentioned, people are going back into the workforce to well, yeah. socialization. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think I mentioned this to you the other day. I've taken an Uber more frequently, probably in the last month than I have in the last two or three years, just for different reasons. And 
every time, it is not the person's only job. It's their second. It's their third job. They have multiple jobs. That's yes. right. We're seeing more and more people do that, which you know makes me think and wonder: Does that skew maybe some of the job numbers? Too? Absolutely, because you're seeing a lot more part-time gig. The, the gig economy is alive and well, and for some people, it's not a gig. Yeah. It is how they make things, how they put their household cash flows together. Um, you know, when we do financial plans, we find that people, as, as Danny said, people working long, longer, some out of choice, most out of necessity. So you got to have this realistic approach to retirement. It's not this bucolic thing you you see on commercials where, uh, you know, know your number, all this this fantasy stuff. Some It's not going to be that way for many people. So we wanted to give you the most pragmatic approach to this. And interestingly enough, by delaying retirement by three to six months has the same impact on the retirement standard of living as saving as an additional 1% of labor earnings for 30 years. So people that are like, oh my gosh, I'm 63 years old. I got to get out of the workforce. Wait two more years so you can get to Medicare. Right, Danny? Not only that, the additional cash flow coming into savings and, and postponing withdrawals has an exponential effect on retirement survivability. We also want to talk about the black hole or crossover risk. And Danny and I talk about this as being, I don't know if you ever remember the show, Tool Time, but we think of it as, you know, once you're Tim Allen, you're the young guy with a wife and three kids, but then you're Wilson on the other side of the fence peeking over the older guy in retirement. You have to understand there are different investment methods between the fences and how you have to look at things. But that black hole is a feeling of displacement. It's an unease. That first year in retirement, you're not settled. You got to, don't avoid it. You have to embrace it and understand it. You have to remain vital. You have to remain social and look at the core skills you had uh, at work. How do you re-engage with them um, in, that you had in your career? How do you put those to work in retirement? Yeah, and I think it's really important for people to understand and make sure that you're doing this before you actually have that crossover risk and you go to mm -hmm. retire. Make sure you do a little bit of a practice run and, and understand because this is also going to help us when we look at financial planning. You know, we don't want to put the cart before the horse. We need to understand exactly what what are the things you want to do? What are the hobbies? Where do you want to re-engage? What are your, your goals and objectives, which are going to help lead us to the more quantitative results, which everybody, for the most part, Rich, most people know the numbers of what they've saved, but many times they struggle with understanding exactly how they're going to make distributions right. and where those funds are going to go. And that, to Danny's point, that crossover risk is real, and you're going to see it, or if you haven't already, the people that quit during the pandemic... Yeah, besides inflation and the and the derail in the markets, they went, ooh, maybe I took this step too soon. You gotta mm -hmm. like warm up into it. I find it especially for men, Danny, right? Where if they retire cold turkey as opposed to maybe transitioning to less hours, part time, you know, that slower transition, it's it's a lot more of a an effect on them. So right. you gotta respect that crossover risk. Matter of fact, if you go to RIA uh, real investment advice type in black hole, we've, we, we've written a lot about this crossover risk that you might find interesting. But we seek a full circle retirement. I had a client who was an artist and she used to work with Spirographs. Maybe Danny's probably too young for Spirograph. Oh no, I know Spirograph. Oh yeah, okay. But oh, yeah. she made these giant ones, giant. And they were on the walls and she would take them and move them and create all these circles. But there's a point in Spirograph, I don't know if you remember, it takes on a momentum all its own, like your hand barely moves. And I looked at that and she goes, why are you looking at this so strange? I said, there's something about retirement here. And then I realized that the art of a happy retirement is the creation of these meaningful circles in the beauty of all the variations among them. It's a consistent rotation around sources of fulfillment and purpose. They create a force of their own. In that moment, that art of living emerges. How many times have you heard people say, I don't know how I ever worked. All I'm so time. busy. I'm so happy. But you got to transition to it. Not only that, what we're trying to do in this guy, Danny and I, is make sure when you exit that right lane to retirement and you're in that prep, you don't have to get back on the freeway and work longer. How many people do you think, Danny, since the pandemic, since this derail, have had to get back on the freeway to work? That's the unfortunate part. We either 
fail to plan mm-hmm. or we just don't do anything at all. And that's the, that's the issues that we underestimate quite a bit, or we think that we're going to do that much better than we typically do. And so we want to make sure that we have a really clear understanding as far as how all this works together. And so right. step one is that utilizing lifetime retirement distributions with variable assets. I think this is one of the harder parts because we always, uh, I think as humans, we're, we're pretty optimistic by nature. Mm-hmm. And we always think things are going to improve, things are going to be great, and our returns are always going to be great. And so as we're drawing from assets that are going up and down, so that's stocks, bonds, mutual funds, exchange-traded funds, ETFs, uh, you know, just to name a, probably the more popular investment vehicles, it, is, it can become difficult. Also, we hear about you know, market valuations. You know, they've been very expensive for a longer period of time. Now, we've seen a little bit of a pullback here um, over this last year. But we do have some headwinds. And so where you retire is really based on luck and many times not even in our control as companies will downsize. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe we want to work longer. And really, a lot of people retire much earlier than anticipated for those reasons or to take care of a, a loved one or an illness. And so these are all things that sometimes we just can't control. So we want to keep keep that in mind is, are we going to have that headwind or tailwind? Uh, you know, we may not be able to determine that. And then looking at distributions over a several year rolling period. Now, this is important. You know, when, inside of our plans, we're going to assume for inflation. We're going to assume that we're going to give a pay raise each and every year. But we also want to be very flexible and nimble within the financial planning process in the sense that we want to make sure we know what our needs, our wants, and our wishes are. And then we can say, okay, well, we need to take a step back. Uh, or, you know, many conversations, which I'm sure you've had recently as well, Rich, you know, hey, guys, how are your distributions going? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm hearing more and more frequently, hey, you know what? My money's not going nearly as far. Uh, maybe we need to go ahead and, you know, add a little bit of, of a distribution or withdrawal. Um, in other cases, I'm also seeing where a lot of people are cutting back. Intuitively, we do a good job, I think, too, of saying, hey, we're like we've talked about recently trading down where people say, you know what, we're not going to shop at the high end store. We're going to go to Walmart or we're going to go to Dollar General. We're going to shop better. And that is where, uh, you know, I think we can mitigate just a little bit of this over yeah. a longer period of time. You, but describe the right lane strategy in general, Rich. Yeah. Before we do that, why don't you help people understand what Danny and I are trying to help you understand is there's all these myths in financial uh, services that you can take this fixed rate of withdrawal from assets that go up or down. I want you to get a pot of water and I want you to pour oil into it and see how they don't mix. They sort of work together, but they don't mix. If I'm saying my assets go up and down, but I can take a fixed rate of return every year without adjusting for the conditions, it's wrong. So we wanna help you understand that your distributions in retirement, your retirement income paycheck might have to be adjusted from year to year if you're just basing it on variable assets. And that's very important uh, for you to understand. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about this as we go on. But our right lane strategy is when you look to exit that freeway, you can see the sign ahead, you hit your turn signal, you make the switch. We're in Houston, by the way, so not many people use the turn signals. But Never. Yeah, but what I want you to understand is we want you to get into that mindset that you can get off the lane, get off that lane, and get into your retirement. This is the financial and qualitative pre-exit preparation for your next destination. These are the steps you'll need to take for a smooth transition. And usually, two to five years before your target retirement age, but don't fret. If you're going through this and you're already in retirement, there are going to be steps here that you will also find very, very crucial, very important. You'll be able to take away something, even if you are in retirement, something that you haven't heard before. At least we think so. So we talked about bad luck cycles and where you retire, you can't control. And so do you have that headwind? Do you have the tailwind? And, you know, we may be in a bad luck cycle right now. This chart, though, shows you back in 2008 Mm -hmm. to 2009, if you had a million dollars, and you lost a 60-40 portfolio, 26.8%. That's pretty substantial. Markets were down 38, down 51 at the very worst. Um, But now let's assume that you're taking a withdrawal from these funds as well. And let's just say it's 5%. So now you have a $50,000 withdrawal, cost of doing business, either management fee, mutual fund expense ratios, uh, whatever that may be. No matter what, you're paying a fee, Danny. There's always going to be a fee. (laughs) You're not getting anything for free. Correct. So you have that 1%. So that would bring that new value 
to six hundred seventy-two thousand dollars. Now I don't know about you, but that's pretty substantial. And so, you know, that's a thirty-two point eight percent erosion in principal. And you know, thinking about this, if we're going to continue with that five percent distribution, or you know, old school rule of thumb is typically four to five percent. Uh, we see people go well above it. We see people go well well beneath it. I think that you know everybody's a little bit different in different parts of the cycle. But if we assume for a five percent withdrawal, that's going to be thirty three thousand six hundred dollars of a distribution in that second year. Now that's a significant difference from fifty thousand. That's a life changing event. So Danny, think about it now. You got a million bucks. Sixty mm-hmm. forty portfolios down what? Roughly ten percent. So I'm off a hundred thousand. I'm going to take five percent on top of that, right? Plus yep. my one percent fee. So think about even at ten percent, the principal erosion. Now I'm at the end of my year. I've taken my remember this variable at the fixed rate from variable asset don't mix kind of formula. My first year in retirement, Danny, I'm just down 10%, not 26.8, but I take in my 5% withdrawal. I know I have a fee. Now I'm going to take my my next 5% withdrawal on a much lower amount. Am I going to do that? Psychologically, what am I going to think to do? You're going to start cutting expenses. I'm Right? I, yeah, I might start cutting place. expenses. I might go back to work because psychologically... I'm hurting, but financially, I also could be hurting. So when you're in withdrawal mode, not accumulation mode, like when you first started putting money in, you're now pulling money out. Your principal erosion could be accelerated, and there, and that is not going to recover through your distribution phase. And that's a psychological hit, especially the first couple of years in retirement. So we want to help you understand this impairments to capital are the biggest challenges. So when you look at this portfolio decline of 10% with and without withdrawals, once I add withdrawals to this, it's a lot worse. You know, you might talk to your financial advisor and they'll say, oh, don't worry about it. You know, still stick with your variable rate. What if I get two bad years, three bad years? And I first started out in retirement. The first 10 years of my withdrawals are going to dictate the success of my or longevity of my assets for the following 10 and the following 10 years. Most likely, I am not going to do it. As opposed to having what, Danny? A guaranteed income options like Social Security, probably pension, maybe creating my own pension, where that check's coming in no matter what. But here's what we call the dose of reality. Yeah, that's right. And so many people are experiencing this right now. But this is why I think, you know, we're going to talk about the planning process and what's important to make sure that's included or not included in it. But this is good. This is going to go back to that. But so if we look at distribution, so you talked about that million dollar portfolio, 10% decline, $900,000. We tack on now instead of that five, say just 4% distribution. And now you have a 14% deficit that you must Mm -hmm. overcome. And that's pretty substantial. Now, 10 10 to 15 percent i think is a lot easier than 20 to 25 or 30 or even more but it's going to take quite a bit more to get back so that 10 percent return we need 11.1 just to return back to to where we were now and maybe you're okay with that because you're on a spend down mode but psychologically and 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 also the survivability of your retirement paycheck you're not going to want to do this every year year two year three your advisor should be looking at you going, hmm, we might need to make a change. And what does that do? Changes your retirement income, changes your expenses, changes your budget. So these are the things we help you to understand in pre-retirement. Well, and that's right. And now if you are taking those distributions instead of that 11.1% to get back to equal or even, it's going to take you 20% if you have that 14% decline. Mm-hmm. So keep these things in mind. And, and you know, I think that's why it's so important. And we're going to talk about how to manage money in different different right. environments. Uh, here in a couple slides. But, you know, so we talked about the right lane strategy, what's been included. We talked about the definition of retirement, but these are things that you need to consider. You know, do a return on life assessment. What do you expect to get out of life in these next this next chapter? Um, you know, are you asking yourself these questions as far as, you know, ahead of time? We talk about, you know, we, we train for everything we do in life. I mean, whether it's my kids with t-ball or uh, dance or whatever it may be. And retirement, for some reason, we're just expected to flip a switch and be ready. Yep. And we find many times that's not the case. So think about, you know, where are you going to contribute? You're not on a deadline anymore. You're not contributing in the workforce. 
Um, what's going to give you that sense of purpose? Is there places you want to donate time, um, energy, money? <laughs> what does this look like for you? And then we can back into all those other numbers. And so I think this is a really important element that is so often overlooked, Rich. And mm-hmm. it's unfortunate because that's where we see people kind of you know, wander around rudderless for a while. Yes. Trying to determine what they're going to do. Well, really, we should have been thinking about this for quite some time prior to it. Every and anything that we do with this financially should begin and end with a financial plan. And this is going to help create that roadmap. Now, tell us, what are the things that, that we really need to be mindful of, Rich, within a financial plan and make sure that we're accounting for? Well, first of all, we need to know our needs, wants, and wishes. We really have to search deep down inside, have good discussions, thorough discussions with our significant others, and understand what exactly crystallize what our needs are going to be. How many times are we going to replace automobiles? Do we want to make gifts to the kids? Are we paying for a wedding? How much do we need to keep the roof over our head? You also remember this is an ongoing partnership between you and a fiduciary or qualified planner. If you're doing this within two to five years before retirement, or even if you haven't done it and you're in early stage of retirement, it's very important to look at this so we can establish expectations for you for living expenses. So it's going to include social security benefit strategy, an assessment of healthcare costs, which can be formidable in retirement, impact of taxes, realistic future rates of asset class returns, a behavioral assessment of your ability to take risk, life expectancy exercise, The plan is a vital part of what you do. Before you get operated on, what your doctors do? Danny, do they just go in there and operate? Do they take blood work? Do they take x-rays? Do they do MRI? How many things do they do before they actually get in there? That's what this plan is. This is your full diagnostic. And I will tell you, brokerage firms offer these a lot, but they're lost leaders. They're there to create something, this big book, nice little dusty book on your shelf that is designed to sell high commission product. It always ends on a high commission product. The most important part of the plan is the plan. And if it's going to be a good plan, garbage in, garbage out, you've got to make an assessment of of inflation. You've got to make assessments on healthcare costs, look at future rates of return. You just don't take this planning software out of a box and put it to work. You've got to be an analyst. You've got to look at it in a way that makes it realistic before you move forward. This next step, Social Security, this is probably one of the most contentious uh, topics that we cover. I mean, Mm -hmm. you hear things from both sides that Social Security is going away. The trust funds are are done. Uh, In fact, every year we get new updates on as far as how long these trust funds will last. And, you know, luckily, you know, we really thought the pandemic would impact these quite a bit more. Uh, in a negative way, right. but we've each year been able to add another year or so. And so <clears throat> I'm going to share some stats with you that I think are going to really hit home and and hopefully help you understand a little bit more about Social Security and why it is so needed. And it will not go away. It may not be called the same thing, but there will be something here because there has to be. So, you know, first of all, Social Security is is a basically a pension that you and your spouse cannot outlive. There's also some other benefits associated if you have children. Um, so this can be a really good thing, and it's a really good thing not to mess up because there's going to be some numbers we're going to share with you here on the next slide that may open your eyes a little bit as well. One of the bigger things is that 62% of retirees rely on Social Security for more than 50% of their income. Now think about that. More than half of the population that's retired right now need Social Security for more than half of the retirement income, that mm-hmm. number is huge. Now, diving a little bit deeper, 37% of men, 42% of women receive 50% or more of their income for Social Security. 12% and 15% of women rely on Social Security for more than 90% of their income. So that is a huge number of the amount of people that are relying on it for a big amount. So almost a quarter of the population relies on Social Security for 90% of their income. And we know what the mm-hmm. average payments are. They're not that much. Four in 10 Americans say they're going to access Social Security before full retirement age. We're going to share some thoughts on that as well, because that can be detrimental long term. And then, you know, many cases we we could make an argument that you should wait, delay until at least full retirement age, or if you have the ability, delay until 70. Now, the problems are, Rich, that most people make rash emotional decisions surrounding Social Security, and we say, 
We want to get the most out of this as we can. And a lot of times by taking it early, that's not the case. And in fact, we run a lot of scenarios for clients um, and prospects alike that say, hey, this is not something that, that is feasible if you live until this age. So you that's need to find right. out what's your break-even point. Now, there's arguments and times we could say, hey, it's probably not a bad thing to take it a little bit early. No, it's not. You, you got to keep in mind what Social Security is. It's longevity insurance. If you live longer than mortality tables say, or a spouse, and if it's, if, if it's a woman, if you're married, your wife is probably going to outlive you. So you're not just making this decision for you. You're making it for two of you. And if you have young children, more than two of you. So you have to look at this very unemotionally, take the politics out of it, understand the dynamics of it. Taking it early, a lot of people will take it early because they say, I got to get out everything I put in. That's not the goal. The goal is if you live longer than expected. I find, I come across so many people, Danny, who know when they're going to die. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I'm not, oh, no, I'm not going to live that long. Man, if, well, if I knew, not, I mean. I mean, like, do you have some sort of mystical magic eight ball that I, so I always ask this one question. What if you're wrong? Yeah. What if you're wrong? where I could have taken the maximum out of Social Security along with cost of living adjustment. So you've got to look at this decision from different, a different prism, different perspective, different lens to make the right choices. You also have to remember that if you start Social Security while you're working, say at full, prior to full retirement age, 62, you're going to have benefits withheld. A dollar for every $2 earned over $19,560. At full retirement age, those benefits are going to be adjusted. But keep in mind, there's no reason to take Social Security at 62 if you're still working. Now, if you're going to, I had to work with a client recently, Danny, that wanted to take it early. She was not doing well. Mm -hmm. I understood the reasons. She was going to work. But the thing is, we are work, she's working a job that's going to cause her to come in below the threshold of 19,560 so that her benefits are not withheld. We talk to so many people that talk to their broker and their broker will tell them to take it early without even understanding the take full- Take it early, go invest it, don't worry about without it. Without the full can. repercussions of it. So you have to keep that in mind. Also, you have to remember that up to, Social Security could be taxable, right? So we put some numbers in here for you as far as what provisional income is over 44,000, up to 85% of your Social Security benefits are taxable. Um, and provisional income, or what's considered taxable for Social Security is going to be a little bit different than what you usually think because it's going to include your modified adjusted gross income plus half Social Security income plus tax-exempt interest. So if you're thinking you're doing well with these municipal bonds, yes, from a federal tax perspective, you are. But for Social Security taxation, they're adding it back in. Sneaky sneaky dogs. So you are going to understand too that within the formula of social security, there's an average and in index monthly earnings. So you say to yourself, well, you know, I see these cost of living adjustments happening for social security. That's great because they have been good over the last couple of years. They will be next year. But you don't understand that within the formula itself, when you go to your social security statement, there's an increase for, for wage growth. And wage growth has been strong. So you, I think, Danny, you're looking at an increased uh, bolster to benefits that you may not realize you have. So what we're saying, again, take your time, look at Social Security objectively, understand your own health, not only your health, but the health of your spouse, and coordinate those benefits and fit it into your overall financial plan. What well, has to Very be something important. that the two of you are doing together, because especially if you were the breadwinner, you don't want to take it early because if you pass, then your spouse is going to get your social security. Now, if that's, I'd rather them get a much larger amount than a smaller amount. So remember, we're talking about over two lifetimes here, but you have to understand how it works. Make not just sure. your life expectancy, right? It's yeah. joint. And if you're taking it at 62, there are studies out there, Danny, that show men will go ahead and take social mm -hmm. security early and not inform their spouse. Ooh. 
Yeah, that's a bad decision, guys. I can assure you that. And I had somebody, you know, you mentioned the, uh, you know, if you made over nineteen thousand five sixty, you're gonna have uh, two dollars, or for every two dollars over that amount, you'd have a dollar withheld. Mm-hmm. I had a client who they called me one day, said, "Danny, look, I made a big mistake, and you're gonna be mad at me." I said, "Okay, what happened?" I said, "I went ahead and took the benefit. I talked to my neighbors, my friends. Everybody said you got to go ahead and take it. Social Security's going away. I need the funds. Well, now I have to write a check." Mm-hmm. For every single dollar that I received, because I made too much money, even though I wasn't working, okay. So they had see, deferred compensation. They right. had other things going on. Right. So that's not the only time I've heard this story, but you know this does happen, and you don't want to get caught like this. Keep this in mind. If I take it early, like your client did, Danny, mm-hmm. Social Security is not going to cut the benefit. They're going to send you your benefit. Then they're going to go back and go. Wait a minute. Look at what your income was. We want some of our money back. Yep. And in some cases, all of the all, money. All of our. <laughs> and now you've locked in a discount on what, you're, what you'd receive at full retirement about about age. 25% your cut to amount. your benefit and a 25% cut to your spouse's benefit. Yeah, that's huge. Be so, smart with it. Be smart with it. Yeah, don't make rash or yeah. emotional decisions. To, yeah. Like you said, make sure it's objective. So the other thing that I think is... You know, we do a lot of lunch and learns and, and on individual topics, Social Security being one, this next one, Medicare, this is one that, uh, you know, there's so many moving parts. It's the alphabet soup of healthcare, And I think there's also a lot of um, misunderstandings as far as what it will cover and what it does. So number one, Medicare, it doesn't cover all of your health care expenses, nor is it long-term care. Keep that in mind. A lot of people will think that, oh, this is gonna, going to cover everything. I'm not going to have to worry about it. It's also going to cover long-term care, end of life. That is not the case. Keep in mind when we're talking about the main components of Medicare. Medicare Part A, this is hospitalization, skilled nursing. If you need to be admitted to a hospital, this is what this portion is going to cover. Hopefully you don't have to use it. You've paid it through your payroll taxes throughout your working career. You're not going to pay a premium for Medicare Part A. Part B, however, you will. So currently, Part B, the the normal premium is one seventy ten, so one hundred seventy dollars and ten cents. This is going to cover things that you're going to use more frequently: preventative care, going to the doctor, visit, uh, just your basic needs, necessities, lab tests, results, things of that nature. Now, the annual deductible for Part B is two hundred and thirty three dollars in twenty twenty two, and that can be deducted from Social Security payments or paid out of pockets um, if you delay those those benefits, which a lot of people will. Now, Part D, this is your prescription coverage. This is typically between about $30 to $40. This is something, though, a lot of mistakes can be made with this as well in the sense of saying, you know what, I'm not going to sign up because I'm not taking anything. I'm not going to need this. It's very minimal. We're going to talk about the penalties associated with not taking these or not signing up at all or not shopping each and every year. So, Rich, tell us a little bit about the enrollment periods because this is another tricky part that I think a lot of people struggle with. Keep this in mind. There are multiple enrollment periods. It makes Medicare very confusing. We purposely seem to make Medicare more confusing than it is. So you have an initial enrollment period. starts on the first day of the third month before your 65th birthday and extends for se- seven months. Right? We usually suggest that you look to enroll about three months before your 65th birthday. Now, we, send, we mentioned earlier in the presentation people are working longer. So those who are covered by an employer group plan that covers 20 or more employees during that initial enrollment period have a special eight month enrollment period that starts when they leave employment or group coverage concludes. In other words, I may not have to sign up for Medicare. If I'm working, I'm 67 years old, I'm working for an employer, big employer, I check with my benefits department, I ask, hey, are you creditable coverage when it comes to um, Medicare? I don't have to take Medicare at that point. But once I decide to retire, I've got a window to enroll. See, that's another enrollment period. The bottom line is, though, with this, there are late enrollment penalties for failing to sign up for your initial or permanent enrollment periods. It's a permanent penalty that's 10% of the Part B premium for every 12-month period you should have been enrolled, but wasn't. Keep that in mind. So if I quit my job or I retire, 
and I go on Cobra or I find something else and now it's past my window, I am going to get hit with a 10% penalty for the rest of my life, which is why you need to understand or the people you work with, your financial specialist needs to understand these enrollment periods. Medigap or supplemental coverage, open enrollment starts the month a person is both 65 and has part B and extends for six months. Keep this in mind. We're going to take a step back. When you get Medicare, Part A and Part B, and you're at the deli counter of healthcare. You're getting Swiss cheese. And Swiss cheese has what, Danny? Holes. You got to fill those holes with additional coverage. That's Medigap coverage. We're going to talk more about these supplemental policies that fill the holes of the Swiss cheese and Medicare as we move forward. But we also have to keep in mind is how much money we make because how much money we make in retirement and that includes distributions from your pre-tax retirement accounts that is going to affect my premiums. So this chart here shows what those premiums would be based on income. Now, if you quit work, you have a, a life event, you can go and you can actually appeal what your premiums are. It's called a form SSA 44. This is something I would recommend everybody do as you go into retirement because they're going to hit you with the higher premiums if you're a high income earner. Now, there's also times you can be your own worst enemy. We have a lot of people and, and we talk a lot about where do you put funds while you're still in accumulation? How do you do Roth conversions, make distributions? And I've had clients who say, hey, I want to go buy this lake house, or I'm checking off bucket list items, and we're going to do it uh, right now while we're healthy. We still can. We're young. But all they can do is pull from a retirement account. So as they do so, that's going to impact these premiums. Now, they were stuck because there's a two-year look-back period from, from an income perspective as far as what your Medicare premiums will be. And as you can see, this is not just if you're married. This is not just for you. This is for you and your spouse. And so you want to be very diligent, make sure you understand as far as what we, we call them the IRMA charges, what they would be. And, you know, you don't want to be caught by surprise. We do hear this frequently where somebody says, uh, hey, we took a lot of distributions. Nobody ever told anything. Next thing you know, our Medicare premiums are five, six hundred bucks a month. And that happens more frequently than you probably would think. So keep that in mind. And if you're still in that accumulation mode, this is why we always advocate for putting funds in many different places not just stuffing everything in pre-tax. It's very important to understand that your base premium, each person under Medicare for Part B, is $170.10, Part D, $33. Once I start getting to 182000 to 228000 filing jointly in modified adjusted gross income, I have just increased my Part B premium from 170.10 to 238.10, and my $33 Part D prescription drugs to 45.40. So, you, see, keep this in mind. You take a big distribution out of your IRA because you want to buy a house. You want to help your children. You want to do something with the money. The wave effect of throwing that pebble in the water, the wave effect on your taxes is one thing. The wave effect on your Medicare premiums is another. And a lot of tax advisors don't go over this, Danny. No, not at all. So they understand, oh, well, your federal tax bracket, you know, you're going to go from here to here. But how are you also affecting your Medicare costs? Very, very important to understand the wave from these pre-tax accounts on Social Security taxation and Medicare premiums. And we can make arguments where it's okay to go ahead and pay some of these Medicare premiums, increase those if we believe taxes are going up in the future, you have other distributions that may be coming in. Right. I mean, there's a lot of arguments that can be made, and we always want to be very thoughtful and plan this out for each and every family. This is really important to understand and to make sure that you're making educated decisions with all the information at hand. So, you know, we talked about the the eligibility and the uh, the periods of when you need to jump on. What do the enrollment periods look like? And you, you talked about the special enrollment just a bit. This is really important because I talked to people. In fact, I talked to somebody just yesterday where they had their Cobra, mm -hmm. 66 years old, says, you know what? I've got Cobra. I'm putting it off a while. Don't have to worry about it. And I said, whoa, hold on now. Let's talk about this. You only have a certain specific period of time that you have to jump on or you could go without Medicare for a period of time and have to wait for another enrollment period. 
and be subject to potential penalties. So if you're working, you're past Medicare age, and you've been on a creditable plan, you or your spouse, and you stop, you have an eight-month window from when coverage ends until you must sign up for, for Medicare. Now, COBRA, even though it's your old employer's plan, it still feels like you're on that same plan. You're just paying for it now. It's not subsidized. It does not count as a creditable plan. So the moment you stop working, that's when you need to start that window that that time is ticking and understand to make sure you get on and don't get a penalty. The average penalty, believe it or not, is like 30%. So people wait and mess this up for 36 months on average. So for every 12 month period, you get a 10% penalty on top of your premium that is permanent. So when that 170 10 goes up next year and you have that 10% penalty already associated with it, guess what? That's going up there right with it as well. This cobra snake is going to bite you in the Medicare butt. If you think Cobra, and we see a lot of people as we go through recession get laid off and go, well, I'm 66 years old and I'm going to go on Cobra and they miss their window to sign up for Medicare because they think Cobra is their health care plan at work. It's not. So you have to keep in mind Cobra can really make you cost you more than you think for the rest of your life. So be careful with COBRA coordination with Medicare. A lot of material we go through this here, right? So we go through the slides, read through the material. I almost think this is almost like a textbook, Danny, for people that want to go through this presentation a couple of times, or they want to look at the slides, read through them, share them with other people who uh, feel that they're going through this process and find it important. But we want to talk a little bit about filling the holes with additional coverage in the Medicare Part A and, and B Swiss cheese. And do keep in mind, I want to interject real quick, Rich. I know some of you guys out there say, man, I'm a long ways from Medicare. Uh, don't have to worry about this. Social Security, don't even think it's going to be there. Listen, if, it may not pertain to you at the moment. It will down the road. And I hope you take the tips of you know some of the things that we're talking about and putting funds in certain places. Take that to heart. But also, we know a lot of people who are younger who are helping their parents, their grandparents right. with Medicare. Yes. Really getting into that world of, of trying to find the best plans for loved ones, um, talking about Social Security. Hopefully you can all learn something from all this information as well. So Medigap coverage, filling some of the holes in the Swiss cheese. Medigap policies are private insurance companies. They can turn you down because of your health status unless you apply for benefits during the Medigap in open enrollment period. Medigap is going to closely resemble the, the insurance you're used to at work, right? They'll cover the gaps in A and B, and Plan G is the most comprehensive. So there's a little bit of an alphabet soup here, too. So you go to medicare.gov, put in your zip code, and bring up an overview page of all the Medigap plans. They're all standardized. See which benefits are available, and then pick the right letter for you. And this insurance will couple with your Medigap A and B and you've already filled the holes. There's another way to fill in these holes and it's called Medicare Advantage or Plan C. These you probably know because if you're watching TV, like my favorite Westerns, you're going to see Joe Namath, you're going to see Jimmy J.J. Walker, you're going to see all these people touting Dynamite Medicare Advantage plans. These are very lucrative for insurance companies. They're not bad. They just don't, they're not as, um, let's say, we don't recommend them. We say people can look to Medigap first, but there are some people that need Medicare Advantage. What are some of the pros and cons, Danny, to Medicare Dynamite Advantage plans? Well, I think a Medicare Advantage plan does have some advantages um, in the sense that it is comprehensive typically. So many times it's going to cover your part A, your part B, your part D. Um, It's also going to cover something that your original or traditional Medicare does not, generally speaking. So, you know, keep in mind, original Medicare does not cover hearing, doesn't cover your dentist, you know, teeth. Um, It doesn't cover vision. And many of these these plans will allow that or they'll cover that within there. So um, that's a big pro, I think. Now, a con is that when you're on one of these plans, many times they're HMOs. 
And so meaning an HMO would be a closed in network that maybe it's with the hospital district or, uh, you know, one type of place that you can go. And the issue could be is that if you really need specialization, you may not have reciprocity at another place that you'd like to go here in Houston. Um, you know, cancer, that's that's something that's obviously everybody deals with in a family. MD Anderson may not be covered if you're on a Memorial Hermann plan or another type of plan. So we always have to keep these things in mind as we're looking at Medicare Advantage. Many people will do it because they say, look, I'm in great health. I want to keep my premiums very minimal or sometimes not at all. Uh, they do have those. They also a lot of times are giving away gifts. Like you remember you used to go set up a bank account and they give you a toaster. Now you're getting smartwatches or you're getting a gym membership, which I think, look, those are great. Anything to help encourage good Silver behaviors. sneakers, baby. Yeah. So, but those, those can be some real disadvantages. We're also seeing, Rich, we see a lot of people going into retirement where maybe their, their employer offers that health care plan for retirees. We're seeing a lot more of these plans inside of that. I'm seeing a little bit more PPOs, which mm -hmm. give you that more flexibility within this, but not always the case. So you do have to be very mindful as far as what the difference between original Medicare and the Advantage plan. Um, you can switch back in open enrollment periods, but if you need to do so in the middle, you're, you're kind of stuck. And at that point, you'd also be subject to, um, you know, they're going to look and say, okay, well, do you have any pre-existing conditions? There can be other issues when we look at this from a big picture. The biggest advantage, the things you have to keep in mind with Medicare, know your enrollment periods, work with someone who absolutely understands all the different enrollment periods. Two, you got to understand how to fill the holes of insurance. And Medigap is the most comprehensive and there are no pre-approval, there is no uh, pre-existing condition clauses if you do it within open enrollment period. Medicare Advantage, listen, hey, it's more cost advantageous if you're healthy and you don't require frequent trips to the doctor. Keep in mind, you could be on Medicare Advantage if you get some form of life-threatening disease or cancer, God forbid, whatever it might be, and you wanna get back, you wanna leave Medicare Advantage and go to Medigap, you will not be able to. So make the good decisions up front. This is also where comprehensive financial plan works because we keep track and your planner should keep or your financial advisor keep track of the inflation rate that goes along with Medicare and also the additional out-of-pocket expenses you're going to have because as you age, there are going to be specific out-of-pocket dollars that are going to come out for you past a certain age, say 85 for a few years. Um, so know your Medicare. Step five is, listen, um, you're always told this. You're always told, put all your money in tax deferred accounts. Everything. We have this wonderful farm and we only want one animal to do everything. One perfect animal. It is terrible, terrible advice, right? Most retirees who want to wish to maintain their lifestyle, that means most likely you're not going to fall into the lowest tax bracket. If your primary source of income in retirement is just tax deferred accounts, you have no tax control. All your distributions are taxed at ordinary income rates. So let me ask you, do you think taxes are going lower from here or higher? So this one magical animal that I have on my investment farm or this one magical account is going to be a problem unless perhaps I really do fall to the lowest tax bracket, which is something we've been talking about in financial services since the eighties and never have changed. So at 72, then you have required minimum distributions. That's further loss of tax control because the government is now telling you what you need to take. So you've got to be really careful we call it diversification of accounts. When you get to retirement, I want a farm with a lot of investment animals that do different things that can help me create a retirement paycheck. And we're going to talk more about this later. We're planting the seed in your mind so that you can get over and go, oh my gosh, I was told about everything in tax deferred accounts. No. No, no, no. And we're going to talk about it. As yeah, we go that, that's forward. the problem, right? It, I feel like the mainstream financial media and any of the big organizations have always taught us to put funds into these pre tax accounts. It's the best way yes. to get this growth. But the problem is you, you lose control over it long, over longer periods of time in the sense that Uncle Sam can come and say, hey, you know what? We own 20% of your 401k. 
now we're going to own 30%. And that's the problem when the we big start guy wants more money, you're going to pay. That's right. So keep what you have to remember. The entire financial services industry is based on accumulation of assets. So if I'm in accumulation mode, I want to try to save as many as much in taxes now as I can. But we never think about distribution. Remember earlier in the presentation talked about Tim Allen, uh, Tim, the tool man versus Wilson. Wilson is going to be in a different situation than Tim the tool man. So you have to look at how your accounts are going to fit into your new lifestyle and having all your money pre-tax is not going to be the most effective for most people. So Danny, step six, this is one of your favorite accounts. Oh, I'm going to let you, you know, this is like you just put uh, icing on Danny's cake. So we'll let him go yeah, over health look, savings. Look, account. health savings accounts are, are, are really the best account in the financial world that we can utilize. And now you may not have access to one. Um, this is going to be now we are seeing more and more employers pass on cost to employees. So if you're under a high deductible health plan, so this would mean for an individual, that would mean you'd have out of pocket deductible of at least 1400 bucks for a family it's $2,800. And your out of pocket expenses can't be more than 7000 for an individual or 14000 for a family. So if you meet those parameters, most of the time, you're going to have the ability to put into a health savings account. And the issue is, a lot of times we get them confused with flexible spending accounts, those FSAs versus an HSA. The HSA is amazing. So it's first of all, it's going to give you a triple tax benefit. Funds go in tax-free. They grow tax-free. You're going to use them for medical expenses later in life, hopefully. I'm going to tell you why. And those are going to come out tax-free. The average couple, 65 years old, is going to spend numerous studies show well over $300,000 in medical health care expenses in retirement. So this is an account we don't want you to use each and every year. And these are mismanaged often. We want you to keep the funds, pay your bills out of pocket if you can, any of your medical expenses, and let these funds grow. So we want to make sure that we're utilizing. Now, I wish we could put a whole lot more into the account. So yeah, 2022, an individual, you can put 3650 For a family, you can put double that. Uh, if you're over 55, you get a $1,000 catch-up provision. So not a whole lot that we can put in there from a bandwidth perspective. But I think we can make an argument that we would want somebody to, if you're getting a match in an HSA, maybe you're getting a match in a 401k, you'd want to mac get at least a match in the 401k and then go max out the HSA, then go back to the 401k. Because we want to make sure that we have that those funds in here that are going to give you that more of that tax freedom that we talked about that last slide. This is going to help you get some of that because it's not going to be considered income when you pull it out later in life, not going to subject you to IRMA charges, subject you to for Social Security to potentially be taxed. Um, and so this is a great thing. Now, speaking... With Medicare, this is something that you must cut off distribution six months prior to contri or to going on or enrolling in Medicare. So keep that in mind as you're going down that that path and you say, hey, I'm contributing to the HSA. This is a great vehicle, but about to get on Medicare six months prior. Make sure you cut those those contributions off. This is a great a great avenue, I think, for many people to utilize. Make sure within your plan or your benefit package. If you have this, make sure you're utilizing it and utilizing it properly. The takeaway here is this is not a tax deferred account. These are pre-tax, triple tax free when used with qualify for qualified health care expenses. You don't use these as a checking account to pay for your expenses. You let the money build up over time. And then when you're retired, you have a tax free bucket of money for healthcare expenses. If you're working for an employer and they say, no, yeah, you know, sign up for part A, even though you have an HSA, you'd have to ask your employer, wait a minute, I can either do my HSA or sign up for part A, but you're giving me insurance anyway. Do I have to sign up for part A? And if your employer says, no, don't sign up for part A. Continue your contributions to your health savings account. Remember, this is not a health spending account, it's a health savings account. In retirement, for either additional out-of-pocket expenses, you can pay for uh, some of your Medicare premiums through this. You can limited amount for long-term care insurance premiums. Diversify it out within the portfolio. Don't touch it as best you can. So these are some tax diversification tips we want you to remember. We want you to think about diversification of tax treatment 
or as well as what we call diversification of accounts. I don't just want a pre-tax account. I want to look at maybe Roth conversion accounts. You know, Danny, you and I have been talking about Roth conversions over the last five years. And then over the last, I guess, two or three years, they've become increasingly popular in conversation. They have. And so you want to look at this bucket of eventual tax-free withdrawals to complement your taxable distributions. If you're still working right now and you're, say, three to five years from retirement, ask your employer, do you have a Roth 401k? Most likely you do. They just don't talk about it. Shut off your tax-deferred retirement account funding, your pre-tax. Turn on your Roth 401k. By the time you're ready to retire, you'll have a great bucket of after-tax funds. If you don't have a Roth 401k, although I think most employers do, fund your retirement accounts up to the match because we don't want you to lose the match and save the rest in a plain old vanilla taxable brokerage account. So if your broker says, no, you got to pull all your money in pre-tax accounts, go to your broker, hey, do I have a farm with only one animal? And then he or she will look at you like you're crazy. But you understand we want more than one account to draw from in retirement. So two things I do want you to consider. So three to five years is, is, is great, but really at any age, you could be in your mm-hmm. 20s, your 30s. I want you to start thinking about these things because I do believe taxes will be higher at some point. And you know what? You may even be at peak earnings years. It's okay. Let's find that strategy. Let's be very surgical and understand exactly where those funds are, where you should be contributing. The second thing is a lot of times Rich and I hear that, oh, you know what? I make too much money. I can't contribute to the Roth 401k. Well, guess what? You're right. If we're talking about Roth IRAs, you cannot make that does have income limitations and you may not be able to make those contributions. However, if you have that Roth 401k, that's not the case. So you do have additional avenues that you should be exploring. So make sure we want to diversify those contributions, just like we would with distributions down the road right. to keep more money in your pocket. That's the name of the game. It's not just about investing money for protection and growth. It's also about how do you keep more money out of uncle Sam's pocket and in yours. In the shining, there is creepy twins. Right? Creepy twins in The Shining. They look similar, but they're different. Roth 401k and Roth IRA are Roth, but they're different. You, you can fund your Roth 401k, regardless of your adjusted gross income. When it comes to funding Roth IRA, that's different. That's subject to AGI requirements. You may not be able to fund those. I would tell you, Danny, and I tell you this all the time. If I were in my 20s and 30s again, I would never put any money in pre-tax. You know I stand by this. I, regardless of what I was making, I would have all my money in Roth. So when I retire, all my money is is tax-free. My Social Security is not taxed. I don't have IRMA charges. I am willing to give up saving some taxes today because I can pay them today. When I'm retired, I want every dollar to be the dollar. There are studies out there that will show you, even with people in the lowest tax brackets, Roth is going to work better in retirement than pre-tax. So keep that in mind. Whether you do it, have some Roth, some taxable accounts, tell your advisor, I want a farm with more than one animal. All right, guys. So step number seven, we talk about what should your asset allocation look like as you're going into retirement. And, you know, Rich, we hear about all these different numbers the, the rule of 120 or the rule of 100, you subtract your age by that, and that should dictate how much you should have in equities. But we typically want to go a little bit further than that. And the way we manage money is a little bit different in the sense that it's not that stodgy buy and hold. It's going to be more dictated as far as where markets are. What is, what's the economic conditions? And what are your goals, needs, objectives? What do you need to do with these funds? And I think that's one thing that a lot of these old school rules seem to forget. Yeah, I mean, what you have to keep in mind is that when you're in that right lane and you need to exit, you can't have even a market correction derail you. So it's not about growth as you get closer. Yeah, once you've landed to your exit, once you're there, valuations are better. You can you can change your portfolio allocation. But if you want to make sure that you don't have to get back on the highway to work, at least for financial sake, then you want to look at changing your asset allocation. Because where you retire in a market cycle is luck. Whether you're going to have a market headwind or a tailwind, 
That's, listen, that's a roll of the dice. People who retired in the year 2000, they hit a headwind. They had to watch distributions. People who retired in 2010 had the Fed at their back. Markets did great. They took money out of their variable portfolios and it kept coming back. So when stock valuations exceed historical norms, you want to maintain, it may not be perfect, you know, may not be just all bonds and some stocks. You want to work with your financial advisor, but you want to look that you adjust it properly to remove some of the volatility. Maybe more bonds, maybe more cash. Now, I kept this on purpose to show you stock valuations at the time we wrote this was 41 times earnings. They're not that anymore, but markets are still expensive. So you are still at a higher level of valuation. Um, and you have to be careful. The people we advised to do this at 41 times earnings um, that did preserve a lot of their capital going into retirement. Therefore, they were not derailed. And that's most important. You don't want anything to deviate you from your plan. Not a time to get greedy the closer you get to retirement. You want to stable, I think, is the word you might be looking for. And Danny, you could buy individual bonds today. You hadn't in a while, but you've been able to buy individual bonds 3 4% for a year um, just until you get out there and see how things are going. Why would I want to lose perhaps 20% of my, my um, portfolio growth, right? And protecting assets in the first 10 years of retirement will dictate your portfolio longevity for the next 20 it's all about how, how much in losses that you want to take. And that's very important. So next, we're going to get into five must-see charts in retirement for retirement distributions. I think this next chart, Rich, mm -hmm. talks to what you just mentioned. Looking at PE ratios, how expensive is the market? What are mm -hmm. future expectations moving forward? And I think it's really important to understand that it's a terrible short-term indicator. Right. I mean, for years, markets have remained elevated. Prices have. But now, the other issue is, is that... As we're seeing this, many people think, well, does this mean that every year is going to be really low returns? And obviously, no, it doesn't. But we may have one or two years that could be devastating to markets to overall long-term returns. And those are things we need to keep in mind. So if we can mitigate some of that risk, sidestep some of it, you're going to be much, much better off. I will tell you, this is reversion to the mean at its finest. I think, I think the takeaway from this chart, Danny, is... Sooner or later, valuations matter. Whatever triggers the conversation or the narrative is important. Now it's that the Fed doesn't have your back anymore. And now valuations matter, especially if we're heading into recession. And you notice that the cheaper your valuations, the greater you are as far as return potential versus not, where you have a chance for low returns. We use this information seriously in developing financial plans and look at forward-looking estimates. So you just remember where you are in the cycle before you decide, hey, I'm gonna be real aggressive with stocks so close to my retirement date. Well, it's interesting, speaking just to that, I mean, several months ago, or not even that, even a month ago, a lot of people were saying, hey, let's be super conservative. Whereas now, or as of last week, they were a little bit more prone to take on some additional risk. Yeah. And I think that you know now seeing what just happened over this week, People are maybe beginning to rethink that again. By every measure, stocks are expensive. This is a great chart that Lance created. And what you just have to look at is the perspective of it. Um, we have had a Fed-induced rally. Yeah, sure, companies have gotten leaner and meaner, and they've bought back shares, and they did all this financial alchemy. But keep this in mind. We've had cheap money for way too long, and this detoxification and retirement – they do not mix. So you have to be cognizant of how much risk you're taking. And I think this really outlines it, Danny, as far as the everything bubble. And obviously we've come off these highs um, and everybody's saying that this market, this cycle is over, it's a new bull cycle. It's too early to say, but I, I have to tell you candidly, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to gamble with my retirement if I'm three to five years away. If I'm 20 years away, maybe I, I could weather it out. At the closer I get and, and I'm on that right lane, I don't want anything to deviate me from my exit. 
And this just shows you that if you're not adjusting your allocation, you're taking big risk. Well, I think this next chart is really nice as well as chart number three. So talking about, again, where you retire in this market cycle can be luck, but also putting some of these more minor drawdowns in perspective as well. This goes back to 2009, and you can see these red dots are a drawdown of 5% or more. This is really one of those things that should be expected each and every year. What do we call that? The price of entries, at least a 10% drawdown, mm -hmm. is what we should expect when we begin to invest in markets. And as we, we look at these things, we want to also put that in perspective in the sense that these things will occur more frequently. However, we don't want to make knee-jerk reactions to that. But as things deteriorate further, you really want to start thinking about how do you protect yourself where do you go from here? Right. So if I am an accumulator and I'm saving money for retirement in this chart, the latest Doug Short chart for advisor perspectives, um, this shows you how you've re retraced roughly 14% of your losses. That's comforting to know. But say the markets end here, right? This is the end of the year. And then I have to, again, take my 4% withdrawal rate plus 1%. Well, maybe this year won't hurt me. What if we go forward and you get lower returns? These drawdowns will tend to matter. You see, drawdowns and volatility are the friends of an accumulator because I could be putting in more money at lower prices and I don't have to tap this money for decades. I am a distributor. Remember, we talked about Tim the Tool Man on one side of the fence, right? And we have Wilson on the other side. And if I'm Wilson looking at this chart, I see danger. If I'm Tim the Tool Man looking at this chart, I possibly see, Danny, opportunity. It's not that you don't want to invest in stocks when you're retired. And when valuations get better, nobody says you can't change your allocation. There are a lot of studies out there that show when, when advisors work with retirees, they will take the first step of making the portfolio more conservative. But that's it. They'll never change it. Your portfolio is a living, breathing entity. It's going to change. There's no reason why you, when you're not, when you're in the groove of spending, you know what your budget is, valuations get better, that you can't change your allocation to stocks and get more aggressive. There's nothing wrong with that. But we are making sure, Danny and I, that you launch into retirement. We call it escape velocity. We want to make sure that you have enough to launch and you can stay in that retirement phase. Then the orbit you circle is going to change. Your budget's going to change. The market's going to change. So for your portfolio to stay static for another 20, 30 years doesn't make sense. But this just shows you drawdowns have to be looked at differently, Danny, depending on what side of the fence you're on. That's right. And I think this next chart, number four, we talk about never doubt regression to the mean. And you know, many times we talk about these, we looked at PE ratios a couple of slides back. We're talking about drawdowns. But what happens when you have a lower for longer? And we mentioned that's not an every single year type of situation. Uh, I've had a couple of conversations recently, Rich, where uh, somebody says, hey, you know, my advisor says, uh, we're looking at long-term investing. So we don't make changes. We're going to set a portfolio and we know that long-term it's going to work. We may make a change throughout the year, but for the most part, we're going to set it and forget it. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's the way most of these mainstream financial firms operate. They're going to set it and say, look, over 20 years, it does great. But what if you are in distribution mode or you're very close to it? That can be problematic. Yeah. So this slide here shows if you invested, and, and the, the key takeaway here is that if you look back and you invest in the S&P 500 in 2000, we call that the lost decade. I mean, it took you a very long time frame just to get back to even. Now, couple that with distributions. We know, we've looked at that math. We know what that means. So that can be really problematic if you're not going to be making changes along the way to one, protect funds, two, make sure that you're uh, going to be able to meet those distributions. Mm -hmm. Have that, you know, the emergency funds we talk about, Rich, and also that financial vulnerability cushion to give yourself a little bit additional buffer four times like this. When, unfortunately, when crisis hits like this, there's usually other issues at hand. People are losing jobs. We're seeing more and more layoffs. And we're seeing that today. But it's not the mass layoffs like we've historically seen. It's more the white collar. Just like we saw this week, Ford announced they're letting go of a lot of people. And it's going to be more white collar jobs. We've seen that with other companies. And I think there's probably more to come from that.
Right. Um, again, you're going through a rougher cycle, and if I'm an accumulator, I'll find ways to make it work because I still am an earnings machine. I have cash flow. When I'm a retiree, I've got to look at it as battening down the hatches, understanding my cash flow and understanding where stocks are. And the time to break even um, is more difficult. And, and, and frankly, when you're in spend down mode, you never are going to get to break even possibly because you're spending down your portfolio. You built this, this bucket of wealth to draw from. You just want to make sure that it lasts as long as you do. So bear markets are devastating for everybody. Uh, they don't last as long as bull markets, granted, but boy, they tear you up. You hear a lot of financial pundits talk about that bear markets happen 20% of the time. It's not true. It happens about 40% of the time, which is a very, very big dis difference. And bear markets could average down 38 to 40%. Um, and you will be set back dramatically if that occurs. So again, the message or the theme here for those in the right lane is you cannot afford to take these losses. Otherwise, you're going to be retirement interruptus. It's not going to work. So you have to remember, 40% correction is going to set two, 10 to two men back as well as Wilson, except that you are in withdrawal stage. You're more vulnerable. Something in your life is going to change. Um, so you have to remember, and these are great charts, Danny. I think it sums up the message we're trying to relay. Everybody's portfolio is going to be different. Um, you might say, listen, I stocks, I'm going to live a long time. I have a legacy option. I have a legacy intent to, you know, this, this, this money, part of it's based on my kids. They're in their twenties. You know, I got to look at it that way. Sure. For the money you're leaving is legacy you might decide that, sure, I'm gonna be more aggressive. But where is my cash flow? Where's my lifeblood of retirement? And will this volatility hurt me and not help? And it's just a mindset, Danny. It's a mindset going from one side of the fence to the other. It's a tough thing. We talked about crossover risk. It does happen. We wanna make sure that you're prepared. We talk about how frequently people prepare for everything else in life, but yet retirement, is just about those numbers. And so, you know, one other thing, step number eight is considering what's housing look like in retirement. And unfortunately for many, and we're seeing many more multi-generational homes, Rich, where, hey, it may be falling back on the kids, but is that what they want? And is that really what you want? Um, I would say the state of affairs with many people's households, there may not be many other options, Rich, but what are most people doing and, and what are some of the things that in retirement people should be considering as far as housing? You know, when you first retire at 60, say you're 65, you're 67, 62, whatever it is, your housing in retirement is not going to be a major decision because you're still viable. You're still able to be independent, but maybe a decade in, you want to revise your financial plan and try to figure out, hey, do I need to make some changes here? Do I need to understand if I need to be an independent living? Um, do I want to look at a continuing care retirement community? Listen, there are a lot of housing communities out there for 55 plus. Um, I taught, we have clients that are in a lot of these, the villages, Del Webb, um, you know, communities, and they love them. You know, there's a lot of activities. So if you're an active retiree and you decide this is the way you want to go, or you want to age in place. So you have to do your homework. Once you settle into your retirement groove and then say, okay, what's my housing going to look like in 10 to 15 years? And then start putting that into your, into your financial plan to understand the rising costs of whether it's independent living or say a housing um, community. Another trend, Danny, housing and retirement, you have a lot more seniors or older Americans renting that's right. smaller homes, patio homes, because they don't want to go out there and do the work anymore. They don't want to go out and mow the lawn. They just don't want to deal with it. And it frees up liquidity for them. Everybody is going to do this differently. All we're saying is 
down the road, this is another milestone you're going to have to consider, or maybe a longer living spouse is going to need to. And these prices are expensive. Now, I will tell you, aging in place is the most popular option. It has been, it will continue to be the trend. AERP has some recent studies that show that the, the uh, popularity of this, um, this option, and, and Danny, it makes sense. Why wouldn't you want to be in your own home? This is generally for people in good health. They have a social network, circle of friends, family live nearby. They have a favorable floor plan. So part of your financial plan might be, hey, I might have to spend some money in renovation, right? I got to update the bathroom. Maybe I want to bring down my cabinets. Maybe I need uh, more, uh, I need to expand. I just had a client that needs to expand doorways uh, for wheelchairs, uh, but they're staying in their home. This is where technology has helped a lot of older Americans. I have clients um, who use Uber, who use DoorDash. Like they're, you know, the, it's been a great thing for them to be able to order online and get, in, you know, groceries and everything brought to them. So aging in place will continue to be popular. Now, a lot of people are sitting on a lot of home equity. Home equity is at record levels, even though housing's in, rece uh, in recession, according to Lawrence Yoon over at the National Association of Realtors. He's the head uh, economist. But you still have probably a lot of equity or your house is paid off, but you don't want to leave. Consider a home equity conversion mortgage to unlock your home equity. You can use that to supplement retirement income or maybe make improvements uh, or care for, you know, make long-term care changes, whatever it is. Your home can provide liquidity just like Tom Selleck says on TV. These are not what they were. There's a lot of regulation. There have been a lot of improvements, lower yeah. costs, education, everything to use wisely the equity in your home. Because Danny mentioned earlier, you think your kids want your home. Most likely they don't. Starts yeah. with a conversation with your kids. Well, if it's not on a, a beach, a river, or in the mountains, it's very unlikely they actually want it. And nine times out of ten, they're turning around and selling it. So, right, they're you know, just going to sell it. Anyway. Those are conversations that need to be had. That's exactly right. The novelty wears off. Danny and I've seen this long enough. We've been in this business long enough. We see the novelty wear off. The kids get big. Mom, oh, mom, I don't want to go back to the mountain house. Uh, and then, and then you go, and it's upkeep. Listen, yeah, yeah. Nobody wants your tract home in a suburban. Well, I think you, you mentioned a handful of things that are really important. Obviously, yeah. having these conversations way ahead of time. I mean, doing this, understanding you know where you guys are in life, and also understanding that social network. You you mentioned that, and I think that's something that can be discounted quite a bit right. when you're going to age in place, mm -hmm. um, or even in retirement communities. I think there's some really nice things that they do that force people to get out and be be social. So know yourself or your spouse and understand what could work best for all of you is a really important discussion that needs to be had and something that needs to be put within the financial plan if it's going to be an, an additional cost over time. Now, another big cost, Rich, and it's what we could consider the elephant in the room, is long-term care. Long-term oh, care has is, is. Is, is, is come such a long ways. And if we look back at traditional long-term care, it's beginning to actually fizzle a bit, Rich, in the sense that there are new and better options that are out there that may be a little bit more amicable for most people. But, you know, we hear the horror stories about traditional long-term care. Somebody, they purchased it in the 80s or 90s. There were hundreds of companies that, that did, that uh, offered these types of products. And the actuaries got it wrong. And so now these products are, they're increasing cost over and over again. In fact, I mean, I've had a client just recently, Rich, he's turning 80. When he started, it was under 100 bucks. But now we're looking at $600. Now at 80, it's going to go to 700 something dollars. And then at 81, they claim it'll be the last price hike. It'll be 800 and it change. So this can be a really costly cost over time and something that unfortunately for this gentleman, luckily he has the funds to be able to, to pay this. But for many, they're priced out. And you know, the average age when somebody needs it is 80 years old. So it's, it's really difficult for a lot of households to turn this <clears throat> off. Yeah. But some just can't, they can't make the expenses meet. And so this is where long-term care is, is really important to make sure that you're calculating this. Now, many of you out there, you're self-insured. You may not need this. Some will still utilize something like this just to uh, subsidize some of it. But one of the problems we see, Rich, is that many times you're just sold a product. And it's based on the emotion 
This is something like any and all insurance we believe should be backed into these numbers. You know, what's affordable? What makes sense? What do you actually need? So many times somebody would say, look, nursing care is going to be $7,000 a month. You need exactly $7,000. Well, they forget to ask you, do, what type of income do you have? What are your other expenses? What um, what do your assets look like? Like like you just mentioned, Rich, could you do a reverse mortgage? What are, what does this look like for you and your family? Can so, you tell Danny's had a lot of coffee today? Oh, well, <laughs> hey, man. I'm just trying to keep that up with you, That black rifle's buddy. getting to him. I mean, That's Death Wish. Come on. Oh, Death Wish. Yeah, get it together. Can I get them together? If I well, miss... Listen, but I think this is really important because we we many times... This is something that's overlooked or it's it's just sold and not planned for. Like we've talked about with any of these things, they need to mm -hmm. be planned for. And so take a deep dive into what your financial plan looks like. Inside of that comprehensive financial plan, you should have a discussion around long-term care if it's something that's necessary. Now, for many of you, like I mentioned, it's not. Some may still choose to do something, but for some, it's pertinent to have something there. So the insurance industry has gotten a lot better with creating hybrid products where you have set prices, and you're going to know exactly what you're paying and what you'll receive at different ages. So that's a nice aspect of it. Not to mention, some of these will off also offer the ability to get a refund on these funds. Or basically, it's going to be like a life insurance policy where if you don't use them, you're going to get money back. Now, that's not like traditional insurance, which we all know you, you don't use it, you lose it. And in most cases, we hope you don't. But that's another nice caveat associated with hybrid long-term cares or some of them at least. Wow. <laughs> the man's on a roll when it comes to, there are two things Danny really loves. Health savings accounts, long-term care, and then the family's somewhere in the bottom, right? And, and it's important. It's important because we don't want to face the fact that we may not be able to eat on our own or bathe on our own. It, it's, a, it's a very uncomfortable situation. But people get sold long-term care insurance and to danny's point it gets more expensive as you go forward so there are a lot more creative ways to do it but the first thing you have to do is add it to your financial plan to figure out whether or not you can self-insure do you have equity in your home are you married right because maybe you and your spouse are each other's caregivers for a bit and you just need some custodial care coming in so a lot of times you got to look at long-term care insurance and go, all right, let me back into the number like Danny said and say, hey, I don't need all these bells and whistles. I just need enough. I need to carve out a slot to figure out what we're going to do on our own and then mitigate some of the risk with another kind of product. And it doesn't have to be traditional long-term care insurance. It could be... Uh, cash values from life insurance, hybrid policies, very important as Danny mentioned. The most important part for us to help you understand is you've got to prepare for it or at least bring it to the surface and figure out how it's going to affect your overall estate and longevity of your assets. So obviously uh, you have heard Lance on with Adam and talks about buy and hold and there's something in between. But buy and hold has tended to be a flawed strategy. What you're promised and what you receive are two different things, right? You're promised, oh, I'm gonna get 10% rate of return for every year, it's gonna be clockwork. Yeah, some decades are like, you know, some cycles are like that, but not all. And then, then you get hit with the surprise, the return gap. Oh wait, I didn't earn what I was supposed to earn. Now what do I do? And Lance was able to put this in a chart, Danny, to show you how detrimental it could be because stocks are variable assets. How many pundits have you heard use stocks and compounding in the same sentence when we know compounding only works when you don't lose money? Yeah, it's like the rule 72. People say, well, hold on now. Rule 72, I should have doubled my funds by now. Mm -hmm. But the rule 72 also requires that you have that fixed rate of return, whereas we're dealing with something that's variable. <laughs> Right. I mean, it's, uh, it doesn't work. Yes, you can get a 10% rate of return from year to year, but not consistently. So here's a chart that uh, I think really sums it up. Oh, look at me on my way. Five years, 10%, 10%, 10%. But then I lose 10% in year four. Now, you're thinking the world's coming to an end, but I've already had some really great returns, right? And then in five years, I get 
what I need in the fifth year, if I look at my average returns, one year of loss, one year destroys the entire compound rate, which means now I need a 30% return to recover from a 10% loss. If, if you can't handle this variability, you don't belong in stocks. So one of the lessons we will try to help you understand is stocks and compounding together, don't use it because you could go backwards. People always anchor, Danny, to the high points of their portfolio and think it's somehow magically locked in. Notice that? That's right. We'll have to go back f further and say, well, wait a minute. You started with this and five years ago, and now it's this. But you're anchoring to the last period. especially Usually the high water mark. Right, a high water mark. Anchored. And especially if you're in retirement and you're taking withdrawals, you're more sensitive to it. So we just have to give you some reality when it comes to how you look at stock. But you can have risk management to minimize. Now, when you manage risk, does that mean that you're not gonna lose money? No, you are. I always, I always think of it this way, Danny. I've got a portfolio cut. And I could, I could hemorrhage to death or I can bleed a little, right? If you have risk management, you'll bleed. But we're gonna stem the damage. We're not just going to say, don't worry, that blood's going to come back to your body in five to 10 years. You'll be fine. No, we're going, to, we're going to find a way. But yet at the same time, right, Danny, the industry says, oh, if you're taking profits or minimizing losses, oh, you're timing the market. That's what we get thrown at us. And why is that? Why, why is that said that's market timing, Danny? Because Wall Street wants to sell you that you stay invested no matter what, and they collect their fees, even though institutionally, they're doing something totally different than you are yeah. as an individual investor, right? How many times has Danny, uh, does Lance shared that story with us? Oh, when yeah. He was in, when he was in, uh, working for an institution. Right? I think that's a good story to tell because these, these places manage your money much differently than they manage your own. Plus, they don't buy and hold. Look at how much they make on trading. <laughs> right. I mean, this is a big problem in the sense of, hey, don't worry. We're going to blanket asset allocate. You're going to be in a little bit of everything, and you're going to be in it forever. I mean, we're always going to rebalance. We're going to sell your winners, buy your losers, and that's not always what we want to do. Now, we want to take profits, but do we always want to put it right back into something because it was down? No. Maybe, in fact, we don't want to be in that area at all. We want to remove that altogether. Mm -hmm. Pull the weed out of the garden and get down the road. But... That's unfortunately not always the case with this. And so it's easy, it's marketable. And you know what? It's okay because you're always going to be a little bit wrong because there's always going to be a dog in the portfolio. And that's always going to be the excuse. And look, we can't pick everything that goes up. Nobody can. If that was the case, I mean, we wouldn't be doing this. I think we'd be somewhere with a, at a, on the beach with an umbrella drink. But uh, that's not the case. So the issue is, is that what works well for people or what works well for Wall Street? I'd rather be on Main Street than Wall Street. But that also comes down to the fact that risk management isn't, isn't an all or none strategy. Risk management isn't, I'm gonna take all my equities off the table and then I'm gonna come back. It rarely, it, it might work for you once or twice, but over the long run, it is not going to work. That's not risk management. That indeed is market timing. So if you have $1,000 in a buy and hold or $1,000 in risk management, what you're trying to do is capture the upside, but minimize the losses on the downside. So when recovery occurs, that you don't need as much to get back to even and to move ahead. The toughest part is when you're in a down cycle, Danny, people believe that stocks are going to zero. In other words, we're never going to come back. We're never going to come back. And that's why I have to be all out and all in. If you're going to do that candidly, I would say you shouldn't be in the stock market at all. Psychologically, it, be, it becomes extremely difficult because, look, we can always rationalize. We could rationalize, and usually we don't care when markets are going up, but when they go down, oh, man, we've got to put something to it. Keep this in perspective. Markets went down prior to us finding out that we were in a recession. Mm -hmm. And they're going to go up prior to us finding out that we're out of it. <laughs> markets are going to move a little bit quicker than you typically would. And so we don't want to be all or nothing. 
Because many times, then we'll say, oh, well, we, we missed the initial run. We're out. We're going to get this huge pullback. And maybe they don't pull back the way we'd hope. So having a little bit in is much easier than getting all the way out and then trying to get back in. Because, Rich, how many people have you talked to over the last five to ten years that got out in 08 and they're still not in? They're trying to get back in. They want to get back in. But they can't yeah. bring themselves to do it. I know some people that timed the out perfectly yep. during the financial crisis. I mean, like, did I say, did you have a magic eight ball? Did you go to the fortune teller? W whatever you did, it worked, but then they never went back to your point. So over the long run, I might as well be in T-bills. It, it's, just, it's just not worth it. You don't let your emotions sort of steer ahead it's okay to feel pain it's okay to be angry it's okay to feel all these things but don't take it out on the portfolio the goal is to try to minimize losses and you can't avoid losses but you certainly can avoid as i said bleeding hemorrhaging to death or bleeding a little um it just shows you though the math of loss must be considered as you're close to retirement um, compared to over the opportunity for gain. And this chart really does show. So if when you look at this, you realize 40% drawdown on 100,000. I need 66.67% return to get back to even. If I lose 50%, I need 100%. That is just math. Even though it goes, what? Yes, if you do the math, you'll see that this is correct. Now, again, we've been hitting this point ad nauseum. But if I'm an accumulator, not anywhere near retirement, I might look at that 50% down as an opportunity to buy. Not that you can't, but you can't ride it all the way down to 50% if you're close to retirement and we're in retirement either because you don't have the time. So you just have to remember the math of loss is so detrimental. Uh, well, and go back to the to why you created that initial chart on the math of loss. I think that's a good story, and it gives it does shine a little perspective on the overall, you know, why we want to be a little bit more like a buy, hold, monitor, and sell versus just buy and hold. Well, obviously, just the math of loss, right? Go ahead and go into your broker's office and ask them, hey, um, do you have a chart that shows me if I missed the ten worst days in the market? No. Now you missed the ten best days. They'll have that chart all day but they won't have this one. If you're with a mainstream wirehouse, they're not gonna have it, right? But it just shows you how detrimental losses are. If you, if you miss both the 10 best and the 10 both days, you can see where you stand. But missing the 10 worst days adds more to your wealth. It's funny, but these usually happen during bear markets, Danny. The best days and the worst days. That's which right. shows you even through bear markets, just like we just saw, you're going to get tremendous snapback rallies in markets. And well, you don't want to miss those. And you don't want to miss those. Some of the best days come after some of the worst and vice That's versa. Right. I mean, it's just That's the way right. it happens sometimes. So we're trying to keep you guys on your toes, switching topics quickly, moving from thing to thing. Um, I know everybody's wondering, what do we do with inflation? Where does it go? When do we see this actual disinflation everyone's been talking about? And so wanted to share some numbers with you here. So break down the CPI chart here, Rich. Well, obviously, inflation's always been an issue, uh, and, and it's skyrocketed here. Um, so obviously, when you look at energy prices, food and beverage prices, um, you really can see um, where we stand. We, we've seen some of these prices start to cool down. But you really, especially, Danny, when you look at energy prices, right? Look at where that is. Look at medical, medical care is always an issue. It's always ahead of the CPI. Obviously, if you want apparel or any of the stuff that you really don't need to live, that's not that important. I don't remember the last time I, you know, some people have changed out jeans or, <laughs> or pants. But the stuff I need to live every day, that's where inflation has been tough. If you notice, the S&P 500 and rising inflation don't mix. Generally speaking, we had a really strange year in 2020, didn't we, Danny? It was. It was a very odd year on how quickly the markets recuperated. That's not typical, especially in the environment that we faced. I mean, everybody received a lot of fiscal monetary policy. I mean, that's, that's what helped get us through the time that we were in. Right. In 2021, inflation went up and markets went up when it really should be the opposite. 
right? You have to you have to quell inflation. All this market talk about pivoting doesn't make any sense because if the Fed target rates two percent, and even if inflation's cooling off at eight and a half, you have to inflict a lot of damage. Like how? What do I say on the radio show, Danny? The Fed's going to need to break something to fix it. They will, and they haven't technically and broken anything as of yet. I mean, we did for yet. a bit, and then we've seen this this market recoup a bit. And so, with this retracement, it's allowed. It maybe gave them a little bit of breathing room going into this next week, or with with uh, Jackson Hole, with all the things that are occurring coming up. Usually, rising rate environment is not a terrible thing. Inflation is not a terrible thing. If we see that organic growth, the problem is this has been completely man-made. Mm -hmm. The stimulus is designed to be, you know, kindling to a fire, the fire starter, and then the economy grows on its own. Yeah. Unfortunately, it has been the whole thing. You can't give everybody money and expect them, tell them not to pay their necessities, their bills, and think that we're not going to create inflation. Oh, and by the way, we have a supply chain disruption because people being shut in. We've got bigger problems now. We do. We do, and, and there's no magic elixir. You, you watch the news, you see how people have become really creative with overall demand destruction and, and, and changing habits. Um, inflation is a unique process for everybody, and a plan is too. So we have clients who have micro-budgeted. They know where every dollar is going and how to change it. Um, they have deferred purchases. What were the things, Danny, we were talking about cars and, and homes? Wait. Wait. And we're already seeing prices come down. Or buy simple. If you need a washing machine to wash clothes, do I need it to, to serenade me with Moon River? I don't need that. I need something that is going to wash and dry my clothes. I had clients recently that went and bought, you know, damaged you know, it's got the uh, a washing machine has a scratch on the side. Which nobody's ever going to see. No one's ever yeah. going to see it. And yet the prices are reduced dramatically. Think about the function, the plain old function of an appliance. Do you really need to go high end with people it? People are beginning to see that less is more. I mean, with these high end appliances, we're beginning to see it's just one more thing to break. And it's harder and harder to get those old ones. I mean, I had a, a washer and dryer from college for, I mean, man, a very long time until mm -hmm. we needed... We need to get one just with additional children, something that was larger. So as we go through this inflation battle plan, um, you can negotiate your interest rates on credit. I've worked with people who have done it. We've done uh, television interviews about it. I'm not saying it's easy, but you can call your credit card company and say, listen, hey, I've been with you a long time. Can you help me out? You're going to have to be a little bit persistent, but I will tell you, if you get to the retention department, it could work. Social Security with their call of adjustments, with the cost of living adjustments have been great, right? So you got to postpone Social Security to increase your household cash flow. Dividend stocks, right, Danny? Natural resource, energy stocks, they've had run-ups in prices, so you got to be careful here, but they can continue to work. Gold may or may not work. Listen, uh, when the dollar is as strong as it is, gold is not working. Um, gold sometimes works in a more deflationary environment, so maybe, Danny, as we come out of this, Gold will work better. Tips can work, but we, we know that investments are limited. You have to go through Treasury Direct. It's $10,000 per individual, but tips can absolutely work. Inflation ex indexed bonds, um, those are a little different. Expectations right now are negative for long-term rates on inflation. If you're looking out for inflation in the next five years, you're seeing expectations come down well that's the thing we've talked about we may be at peak inflation or very near it yes so when you're purchasing these these instruments think about have we already seen the run-up in it and you know i know it's easy when we mm -hmm. see something that's done very well and everybody is getting the uh seeing the advertisements and the ads for uh looking at oh look you need to be in i bonds they're making x amount this this last quarter or this has made so much well, guess what? We may be past some of that. Right. That may not be the best investment for us now. Remember the old adage, Warren Buffett, buy low, sell high? It's extremely difficult to do. It's still the prudent thing to do, though. And it it's is. not to say you can't carry momentum, and momentum can carry you higher, but have that discipline on when you should exit as well. Eventually, inflation will moderate. It's going to happen just based on falling into a contraction in the economy. It's inevitable. Well, we're going to be, begin looking at year-over-year -year numbers where inflation was much higher the further mm -hmm. out we get into 
this year. So I think that we may start to see that disinflationary push here at some point. I hope we do. I know everybody else does as well. But yep. So one of the big things, you know, we talked about, we start, you begin and you end with that financial plan. Mm -hmm. And there's so many variables. I think hopefully you guys have learned a little bit about what we feel is important. And really it should be having somebody that has an unbiased opinion and doesn't have a product to sell. Uh, start with a certified financial planner, uh, but also understand who do they work for? Do they work for you or do they work for you know, the, the, big, the big box firm? Because that could be two separate things. Mm -hmm. You know, here's one that we see all the time, Rich. We talk to people, hey, you know, oh, I have a financial plan. Well, great. I'd like to see it. Let's talk, let's talk about it. I don't need one. When we see these ad, these really high numbers within the plan for rates of return, eight, nine, ten percent. Um, I've seen higher. I'm sure you have yep. as well. Yep. And the other thing is a lot of people will get these plans, they're unrealistic. And then when we get a down market like we're in right now, the plan is completely blown up. And that's that, true. That can be an issue. I know you also see a lot of other things where somebody will get a plan and they stuff it in a drawer and they never look at it again. And we talked about this earlier in the presentation. Many times a financial plan is a loss leader. Yep. It's designed to sell a product and then it's never looked at again. And that's not what a plan is supposed to be. You have to adjust the plan inputs to examine the world you think is going to happen in many ways. You have to be a student of inflation. We study inflation for everything and adjust those goals. And then you got to say, well, listen, a plan is like a snapshot of your life and your life is moving. It's time to make an adjustment. Plans never perfect. Retirement isn't perfect. But if you don't wait for everything to be perfect, you're going to miss out. So we got to look at this plan as your blueprint for everything you do. Uh, it's very important. And to Danny's point, a certified financial planner who's a fiduciary has your interests first. That's what you have to do. That's who you have to look for. Yeah. And don't get paralyzed by the plan. The plan is going to be living, breathing. As life happens, we're going to use that to create, say, okay, there's a fork in the road. Here are your options. What's the best thing for you and your family and to help you still meet all of your goals, your expectations? So, And if you so let's think about it this, Danny. People yeah. don't sometimes like to do plans because they're worried about, you know, I haven't been a good steward. This plan is not like a death sentence. It's ways to say, okay, well, let's find ways to get back on track based on your lifestyle. No one's going to chastise you. It's going to say, okay, I have to set forth on a better path. Small changes over time lead to big results. We have seen it. Yep, that's exactly right. So keep those things in mind. We hope you guys have learned something from this today. Uh, if you have questions, concerns, you can always go out to realinvestmentadvice.com. We'd be happy to answer any of your questions that you may have. Um, also, go sign up for Lance Roberts' weekly newsletter. That comes out every Saturday. Uh, it's required reading for most. Uh, also, realinvestmentadvice.com. Each and every day, we're providing lots of new information. And then you can also go there to the events tab. So if you like what you heard today, we also do a lot of one topic events that may be on social security medicare long-term care fafsa it could be on markets uh we also do candid coffees where we kind of keep it like office hours we answer questions live so mm -hmm. you can go to events tab on riaadvisors.com or realinvestmentadvice.com see all that we have going on um and don't forget go sign up to the youtube channel the real investment show lots of information coming at you on a daily basis live from 6 to 7 a.m., but you can always catch it later in the day, which we know a lot of you do. We really appreciate you guys spending some time with us today. We're here to help. Mm -hmm. We do have five certified financial planners on staff. Uh, we are a fiduciary registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, as a registered investment advisor. And we're a little different. We're not your historically, you know, just your buy and hold firm. We're going to manage money a little different. We're going to talk about these things. We put this into your plan. We put this into action. And we're not your, just your old school, stodgy, buy and hold firm. And, you know, we try to be as transparent as possible. Our clients, they're going to get what, Rich? Every week in their inbox, they get an update from what we're doing. And, oh, by the way, you can go to realinvestmentadvice.com and get a daily market update. So a mm -hmm. lot coming at you. A lot of information. A lot of knowledge. Um, there's a lot in this presentation. Um I am hoping that there's at least one bit of information that was important to you, something you didn't realize, or something that you have to tell, need to tell your parents or grandparents, hey, have you looked at this? 
it could be a little bit different than what you've been told in the past. So that was Danny's job. That was my job. Get you thinking. Make sure you're all prepared for your new adventure. Thanks again for being with us. I'm Rich Rosso with Danny Ratliff. We're honored that you spent some time with us today. All right. Well, that was the big presentation. Now we get to the exciting part, folks, where you get to ask your questions directly of uh, the gentlemen that were just in that presentation there, both Rich and Danny. Uh, we'll have Lance involved, too. Uh, Rich, Danny, and Lance, make sure you guys have your um, your cameras on here. Uh, so everybody, a couple quick things. So first off, if you uh, enjoyed that, what I think was an excellent presentation, um, let us know in the comments. Um, also, uh, if you'd like to see us do more of these type of webinars, uh, let us know that too. We're piloting this here, so we wanna see if you guys want more of this stuff. Um, all right, now in the chat here, guys, uh, start asking whatever questions you want. I'm gonna be pulling uh, questions out of that as best I can. We probably won't be able to get through all of them in the remaining time we have folks, but we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. I have a bunch um, written up here too. Um, all right, I'm going to bring you guys in. Rich, it looks like for some reason your camera is not working, but hopefully that gets fixed soon. Um, there we go. We got you, Lance. Um, Danny, let me bring you in. And Rich, I'm not sure where he is. So, Danny, you might actually have to tap dance for uh, for, for Rich for right now. Uh oh um, It won't be the first time. <laughs> wouldn't be the first time. All right. Um, all right. Look, uh, guys, great job. Danny, thank you. And Rich, if you can hear me, wonderful job. Um, Lance, you weren't kidding. You got a great team here. So I uh, got a ton of questions. Um, let me just start on some granular ones and then we'll get to some higher level ones. Um, what are your guys' general thoughts on annuities? I saw people saying, hey, they're seeing you know some annuities being offered these days in the like five to five and a half percent range. Um, I know some financial planners have said, I won't touch annuities with a 10 foot pole. I think it's probably more nuanced than that. So Danny, what do you think? You know, uh, that's a great question, Adam. That's a that's a really hot topic. And I think especially in this environment, we need to be careful because many times annuities are sold and not planned for. And so we want to make sure that when we're talking about doing an annuity, we understand the, the good and the bad. So everything has a pro and con. So at the end of the day, we need to make sure we're looking at it through a plan. So annuities get a bad rap generally because there's a lot of guys out there and that's all they do. They sell annuities. And you, everybody hears about the plate, plate liquor dinners and where you, you get to this dinner, you get a great steak. And at the end, everybody gets an annuity. Lance gets an annuity. I get an annuity. You get an annuity. And that's where they get a bad rap. But these can be used very thoughtfully. And I think they can be a great tool if you look at it through a plan, you understand exactly how they work, what we're using them for. And a lot of times this can be great because pensions, defined benefit plans are a thing of the past for the most part. And so if we can use an annuity to create a, an income for somebody to cover all of those non-discretionary expenses, I think they can be a wonderful tool, but they need to be planned for, they don't need to be sold. And that's the key. Yeah, and, right. and, I, and I have base, just real quick, I have yeah. kind of three basic rules for when I talk to people about annuities, which is, you know, do you qualify for an annuity, right? There's kind of three basic needs when you have an annuity. The first is, is that you have some type of, of lawsuit prone type business you're in. You know, you're a business owner, so you're always subject to lawsuits of some, you know, somebody slips and falls, whatever it is, um, you know, malpractice insurance, whatever it is. So annuities are great because they're judgment proof. Once you own an annuity that is protected and ju against judgments and future lawsuits, those type of things. So, so annuities are great for that. The other um, second key kind of component is, is if you're looking at your income stream, this is where Danny does a great job of, you know, looking at your assets, what the income stream is going to produce and what you need to live on. Uh, this is what we call the Alpo diet, which is if you look at your basic necessities, you know, lights, rent, uh, you know, um, you know, air conditioning, sewage, trash, everything but food. I mean, so you're paying your basic necessities and now eating Alpo. Um what an annuity will do is provide that basic check every month to cover that basic necessity of living. And then basically you just work a part time job or whatever you need to, to cover food costs. But that way you're never out of risk of, of not having the money to pay your essentials to live on. So that's kind of number two. If you're in that situation, 
and need that guaranteed income every month. An annuity is a beautiful thing for that. Um, lastly is, is that, you know, you just have a lot of savings and you need something that is going to grow tax deferred and, and give you some ability to, to shelter some assets. And you just have so much income coming in that, you know, your 401k is really just kind of tapped out. And that's where we start talking about whole life insurance policies, which are fantastic for excess savings. Uh, but annuities work very well also for that for that issue. And, and lastly, really just one other thing, if, you know, I, you know, a lot of people right now, they're super, they're like, the world's coming to an end and I can't afford any risk and, and everything's just going to hell in a handbasket, et cetera. If that's you, an annuity would be great. Forget about the stock market, forget about investing, forget about buying precious metals and all that because those are all very volatile. So when they start moving up and down in price, you're going to freak out, make the wrong decisions, sell low, you're going to buy high, you're going to do all the wrong things and destroy the value of your capital. If that's you, buy an annuity. They are awesome, right? Now, there's some drawbacks to annuities you have to be aware of, which is, you know, you do lock up capital for five, seven, 10 years. They do grow tax deferred. You are paying some additional fees. But for all those reasons I just laid out, annuities can be a fantastic option for some of your money, not all of your money. And, and to Danny's point, when we talk about advisors selling annuities, they're always like, you need to put all your money into an annuity. No. They are they are a tool in the toolbox, just like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, precious metals, whatever. They're all tools and you have to use them properly to get the goal that you want to get. But annuities can be a great tool. All right. And Rich, welcome back. Glad to have you back well, here. I'm going to give you this is one financial planning lesson for everybody. Life gets in the way. And then you got to rethink things. Because right now in the middle of this, the computer needed to do an update. <laughs> so yeah. it's now just like real life, right? Just like the plan, just like, yeah. the plan gets interrupted, but you find a way to make it work. All right, good, good parable. Well, look, uh, Rich. The question that was asked was about annuities. We got a, yeah. a great answer from Danny and Lance, um, but kind of a, a, a follow-on question to that, which is, you know, you, you, you near the end of the presentation, you were talking about in uh, talking about inflation. You know, so income is on people's minds, right? I mean, how do I continue to get income after I retire, um, particularly income that might adjust with inflation? So um, uh, beyond potential annuities, are there other income streams that you see as usually being pretty successful as solutions for folks that are in retirement? Somebody asked here about covered call ETFs. I know some people are homeowners and are getting the, you know, the rents. I mean, so they're, they're, they're investment property owners. They get their rents from that. Right. Are there any other types of sources you guys recommend folks look at? Well, listen, you're going to have to be creative in this in, the, in this arena of where interest rates have been. And if Lance is correct, interest rates go up and then they come back down again. Right. So you're in this air, this 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 uh, period of financial repression in, in the face of longevity risk. So Lance already brought up. You already brought up annuities, guaranteed annuity annuities, making smart, uh, making smart decisions with Social Security working a small part-time job, uh, ETFs that pay, but you got to be careful because you're going to be putting money at risk uh, when it comes to income-based ETFs. Reversible mortgage for some, not all, who want to age in place, you can create an annuity stream from your home. The way we look at it is your house is a glacier. And this is where global warming might work for you. I want to liquidate that that, uh, that equity in the home and provide water for me to drink in, in retirement. So there's a way to do it if you're financially responsible. You have to get creative and try to mix the soup as opposed to years ago. And Lance will remember this as well, Adam, as well as you and many people on, on right now. You used to be able to put your money in bonds, make six, seven, eight percent and let it sit. Can't do that anymore. Yeah, you used to be able to put it in a savings account in the bank and get six to eight percent back in the mm -hmm. 80s. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, so real, real quick, Adam, before you jump yeah. off that, I, I've seen quite a few uh, comments here about, you know, covered call ETFs, um, you know, other ETFs in the comment section like JEPI, which is this high income ETF. You know, just be warned that financial assets have a propensity to lose a lot of money. So it may be great that you're getting a five, six, seven percent rate of return on some investment in the market. And, and again, like JEPI, it's only been around for a little while. So we don't even know how this thing's going to respond in a real bear market when we get there. 
Um, you know, but people are chasing yield. So the higher the yield, the more people chase it, run up the asset price well above what we call the net asset value. But uh, again, these don't have a guarantee of principal. So you may be getting some income, but that income can drop drastically. In a bear market, dividend yields tend to drop by almost 50%. So you lock yourself into these assets. And here's what always happens. People are always emailing me and say, well, I, I buy high dividend yielding stocks. That's, that's fine. We buy dividend yielding stocks too. But we also know when to sell stocks uh, at, at times. It is very common that during a bear market, your stock will lose 50% of its value. And then when the stock loses 50% of its value, you're going, it's okay, I'm still getting the dividend. And then the company cuts their dividend to zero because they've lost so much in valuation and the company's in trouble. So now you've lost 50% of your money and the dividend. So don't get trapped into this idea of being a dividend yield investor. It sounds great on the surface. It works out terribly during bear markets. Okay, great, great real, real world uh, cautionary there. Um, okay, so look, I, I, I want to get to a question I've seen pop up a lot here. But real quick beforehand, I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Um, folks were asking if the PowerPoint presentation could be made available for download. Are you guys okay with that? Sure. All right. So uh, everyone watching, I'll get the, the PowerPoint from these guys. I'll put a link to download it in the description below this video uh, as soon as we, we, we make that happen. And so it might be an hour or two or whenever, but if you come back to the video in a bit, we'll have that link there. Um, and I totally understand why they're asking guys a lot of great information in those slides. Um, all right, so you guys talked about the health savings account, which you guys said, it seemed like you were both really positive on that. You also talked about the Roth 401k. Um, can, can it, can you can can folks get those without an employer or do you have to have an employer to get access to those? So unfortunately, Adam, you do have to be you have to be under a high deductible health insurance plan and have you have to be employed. So you have to have earned income. So not everybody has access to these accounts and they're fantastic. I mean, this is one of the best accounts in the world. I mean, you heard me say it earlier. It's a triple tax benefit. This is this is great. In fact, Rich and I often make the argument that you should go max out or, or go contribute to the 401k up into the match and then max out that HSA then come back to the 401k if you're not going to max everything out. The kicker is many people confuse them with an FSA and they use them while they're working. If we can let this grow, it's a fantastic tool. And I suspect that more and more employers are going to continue to pass on the buck to you and I, to the, to the employees. And we're going to see that many more people are going to have access to, access to these accounts in the future. I agree with Danny. Um, I also think that, again, if you have a high deductible plan, even if you're self-employed, it has to fit the IRS definition of high deductible plan. You can couple a health savings account. with it. There's a health savings account bank there. Fidelity has one, but you have to fit the criteria. You might think it's a high deductible plan, based on what you're paying in deductible, but it may not fit into the IRS classification. So you've and, got to and be that's careful. a really good point, Rich, because many people think that you only have access through an employer. You may have a high deductible plan, mm -hmm. then you'd be able to go get one on the secondary market. So that's right. Understand that's right. The, the regulations and this is a great absolutely. Tool. And but a lot of advisors treat these as checking accounts. And we say no. This is a health savings 401k. Let it accumulate, diversify it among the mutual funds that you have in the portfolio or get help doing so, and let it sit. Now, in the Roth 401k, more and more offerings by your organized, by your company, if you're employed, to Danny's point, going to have a Roth 401k. And what we usually suggest, some people decide that Roth conversion is too expensive because you do have to pay taxes converting from IRA to Roth, right? So people have to be real careful with that, work in conjunction with your tax specialist. Roth 401k, we usually suggest if you have a Roth 401k, probably one, your company's never talked about it. Two, you never knew it was there. It's probably there. Three to five years from retirement, I'm going to shut off the traditional 401k spigot, right? I'm going to stop contributing and I'm going to turn on the Roth 401k. So I want to build up that Roth 401k bucket as best I can. Ask your company if you're employed. I dare to say uh, you have it. All right. That's fascinating. I mean, even I myself have rarely heard about that. So um, 
probably pique a lot of people's interests here. Um, all right, so uh, you mentioned Roth conversions just for a second there. I've seen some questions here saying, do you have any general advice for those folks that uh, are thinking about doing a Roth conversion? I know you just said, talk to your tax advisor, but do you have any other tricks of the well, trade there? Think about it, because I mentioned it on the, um, on the presentation. You want a farm with more than one animal that provides sustenance in the form of income, and Roth is completely tax-free. Um, surgical Roth conversions, uh, you have a 22 and 24% marginal rates right now through the end of 2025. These are very wide brackets. You have a lot of room in those brackets to go ahead and start taking money from an IRA and convert it, right? It's good for everybody. Matter of fact, there are studies out there that will show you, regardless of the tax bracket you're going to be in retirement, Roth is still the better choice. Wall Street doesn't like it very much. But unless you think taxes are going lower in the future, you want to come up with some surgical Roth conversion strategy. And Danny, right, this has become – in the face of fiscal stimulus, this has become even more important, right? This has really become a focus over the, we've been talking about it for years, but all of a sudden the last two, three years, Roth has really been making some uh, headlines, hasn't it? Yeah, well, with everybody talking about raising taxes, I mean, this is certainly a, a big hot topic. I mean, there's no doubt about it. So mainstream media has finally caught up and said, hey, now we need to start thinking about Roth conversions, contributing to Roths. And like you mentioned, this, current tax code that we're under is going to sunset in 2026. So it'll revert back. But look, we keep giving money away. Taxes have to go up. I mean, who are they going to come to? So I always equate it to when I'm talking to somebody, look, you have a business. This is a partnership, this IRA, the 401k, the traditional type of account, the pre-tax account. It's between you and Uncle Sam. The interesting part is, is that they can change their ownership percentage at any given time. And our thoughts are the taxes are going to have to go higher just to continue this this path that we're on. So we'd rather people get the funds out while you can, potentially in a lower tax bracket, and then not have to worry about some of those other bigger issues down the road potentially. So you want to hedge your bets a bit, like you mentioned, Rich. You know, you, you mentioned three to five years. I think there's never a time that's too early that you can start contributing to these type of accounts or I agree. Start about conversions. Um, it's just that it's our program, right? But I agree with you. Remember, I always say. If I had to do this all over again, I wouldn't even touch a pre-tax account. I wouldn't yeah. do it. If I, I would. It, if I had to I would do, do it all over again, Rich, I'd do whole life insurance and nothing else. <laughs> well, no, Roth and permanent life insurance. Yep. Right. Yeah. Because I don't have to worry about my Social Security being taxed, fifty cents to eighty-five cents on a dollar. I don't have to worry about Irma on top of my Medicare base premiums Part B and D. All that money is in my pocket. And when I'm retired and I'm no longer an earnings machine, I want every dollar I can spend. And, and that's a major so failure. I totally I think, agree of, with you. Of financial planning in general is that we don't talk about these things more often because many times people get to retirement and say, hey, I'm checking the bucket list off and I'm going to go buy this big. I'm going to buy the lake house. I'm going to go do this big excursion. And they have to take everything from these pre-tax accounts. Then they get Medicare Irma surcharges, so premiums go way up. Um, they get Social Security tax, like you just mentioned. I mean, this is a big deal. And so the goal is, so we talk about investing all the time, but we want to keep as much money in your pocket as we can. And that's the goal at the end of the day. It's more than federal taxes, Adam. It's taxation on Social Security. If you think you're in the lower bracket, your tax specialist is not taking into account the 50 cents and 85 cents on every dollar you're paying on taxes to Social Security. It's it's bumping you up to the next bracket. You don't even know. Great point. Um, all right, guys, man. Uh, I'm, I hope you guys have six more hours of this. Um, uh, uh, well, before I get to this next question, somebody did ask about a uh, backdoor IRA, which I've been hearing about a lot recently, but I don't know if I don't, didn't think I heard it mentioned on the, the, the presentation. Can you just define for folks real quickly what that is? Well, there are people that, for example, um, they can do mega, they can move money from their 401k. Say you've been per contributing, first of all, let me step one step back. You're, you're ready to retire. You have this bucket of after-tax money and pre-tax money. I can now take all that pre-tax money and roll it into a Roth. It's huge, right? As opposed to putting it into an after-tax brokerage account, I can roll it over to Roth. You got to be careful with, with uh, backdoor Roths because there's something called the pro rata rule. So if you already have an IRA, uh, say established, 
then you've got to be careful about this. Well, let me take a step back. Here's how people do it. I have no IRAs. I have no IRA rollovers. I only have a 401 camp, no IRA rollover. I open, I don't qualify for a Roth IRA because my adjusted gross income is too high. But I can certainly do a non-deductible traditional IRA. So I fund my IRA and then I immediately take that IRA and convert it to Roth. That means everything I put into that IRA goes to Roth. Where it gets messy is when people have all these other IRAs and they say, I just want to convert this. Well, no, because the government says we have this pro rata rule and you have to consider all this pre-tax money plus this. So you got to be careful with backdoor rules. I have a lot of people who do them, but that's because they have, they only have their, uh, they only have after tax money and they have their 401ks at work. They don't have IRA rollover accounts to do it. And they fund an IRA every year and then immediately take that IRA, roll it into a Roth. It works. It works, but you got to make sure that you're not fouling up some IRS rules while you do it. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like for a lot of the things you're talking about, you just always have to keep the tax implications. It sounds too good to be true. If it, sounds good, it is. So we have yeah. to help you understand yeah. how to do it. But yes, a lot of people can do it. But a lot of people don't realize they can take their money from an after-tax 401k and roll it over into a Roth, something that you're able to do. And I have people that have opened these mega Roths by, move, by, by taking that action. All right. I'm trying to get to this next question, but people keep asking additional great ones. Um, so Lance, you you just said a few minutes ago, look, if I could do it all over again, um, you know, I'd, I'd do the the Roth and the uh, the whole life insurance. Together. No, I wouldn't even do the Roth. I'd just do the whole life insurance. <laughs> all right. Can you elaborate on that? I got a lot of people saying, hey, I've heard that that's actually, you know, a lot of people have poo-pooed that in the past. So yeah. what what is it specifically that attracts you? And, and, well, and so Lance, real quick before you jump yeah. in. Let's let's go a little bit deeper. It's not just whole life; it's permanent life insurance where you yeah. can build cash value. It's it's the type of life insurance that Dave Ramsey poo poos, right? <laughs> he's a, he's like you know just by term and invest the difference. And look, here's the, hold on, shoot, hang. On. I, I can jump in a little bit. So that's all right. I got it. It's, uh, okay. it's just uh, the mailman showed up. Um, so so here's the thing about whole life insurance or permanent life insurance. And, and you know, this is something that, uh, again, I wish I would have known about this when I was in my 20s. Um, you can when you buy your permanent life insurance, you have a death benefit. Right. So I can buy a million dollars of coverage. So if I die, my spouse gets a million dollars. That's not why you buy permanent life insurance. The reason you buy permanent life insurance is because you can overfund the policy. So I can put in more money in terms of a premium every year than what the actual premium for the life insurance costs. Now, what happens with that extra cash I put in? See, that's the key thing. So I'm, I'm contributing to this whole life policy with after-tax dollars. So to, to, so to, to Rich's point, it's like a Roth IRA. And, and where, where permanent life really works great is for a highly paid individual that when they contribute the max to their 401k plan, it's nothing, right? I mean, you know, I make $500,000 a year. I contribute 22,000 to my 401k. I mean, I've got tons of savings over here. What can I do with it? Well, I can dump all that money. And, and, and again, I set up a Roth. Great. I can, what's it, what it is, it, is it this year, Danny, uh, six, $7,000 into a Roth? Correct. Yeah. yeah depending yeah. on age. So, it's nothing, right? Between the 401k and the Roth, it's nothing. I've got another hundred grand I can put away. So I set up this permanent life and policy, this permanent life policy, so I can dump large chunks of after-tax dollars into this policy. Now there's some rules around this. Uh, you can't overfund. If you hit a limit of funding, it turns it to a modified endowment contract and becomes taxable. It's a whole big mess. So you have to really kind of, and this is where Danny and Richard are great at this is making sure to maximize how much you can contribute and keep yourself you know, out of trouble with the IRS. But the beautiful thing about the overfunding is, is that it grows truly at a compounded rate. It's like a high yield savings account pays three, four or 5% depending on the policy. And that accumulates every year. It has nothing to do with the stock market, has nothing to do with returns. It has a function to do with, with the ownership in the industry, within the actual insurance company and kind of your dividend that you're getting from all the policies being paid in. That grows tax free. So as that money's growing tax free over time, it's growing a cash value that is truly compounding. Compounding returns, as Danny, as Danny and Richard showed in their presentation, if I'm growing at three or four or five percent a year, and then I lose a bunch of money, I've destroyed the whole benefit of compounding. 
But in this type of policy, it truly compounds over time. And the best thing about this is that let's say I've now accumulated half a million dollars worth of cash in the policy. I can then borrow against that policy and use that on a to go buy a lake house or whatever I want for retirement. But the policy, that value of cash, even though I've taken out, I've got 500,000 in, I take 250 out to buy a lake house. The, the, the balance continues to grow as if all $500,000 is there. There's just a loan against it. And if I die, then that cash value is paid off and the death benefit goes to my wife. That is also goes to her tax free. So there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity to build wealth and use it to build even more wealth. Um, I use my policy in particular. I do a lot of real estate lending and high yield loans, uh, collateralized loans. So I borrow against my policy at 4%. I loan it out at 8, 9, 10%. And I capture the spread in between. And then I pay it back when, when I get the loans paid off. So it's a great way to build value and compound returns over time. And again, if I if I had it to do all over again, I can make so much more money with that than I can a stock market account. It's it's kind of ludicrous. All right. And Adam, so it sounds like we should do a, a video just on this. It topic. would be good. It would be good because there's a lot to it. But to, to, to Lance's point, I can also participate in market indices and yep. overfund it and borrow against that policy. During the financial crisis, we had at the time, clients who didn't want to tap their variable asset accounts, I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to borrow from your life insurance policy to take care of your the income and let this portfolio sit. And then when it recovered, we actually went and paid off the loan. But yep. with a lot of people in retirement, that'll use it to set up sort of a small drip program. And that money that is borrowed technically is not considered income. So it doesn't count toward the equation of Social Security taxation yeah. and or Medicare uh, IRMA charges. Yeah. Yeah, so so it, can, it, can be, it can work. A couple yeah, other just, questions around this. So, 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 Lance, so you, you talk about how it compounds over time. These actually have like floors, don't they? Yeah, like, well, what you're referencing is, is more like a fixed index. So it's indexed to a specific market. And then they'll say, okay, you're going to be, you're going to have a cap rate, but you're not going to lose any money if the market declines. Right. So, so your chart earlier more, of, of, of all those market declines of the S&P, yeah. you get to avoid all of that essentially in these things, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. And when you're taking a loan, like you guys are talking about, you're borrowing from the cash value, you're taking a loan from yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I'm curious, when you pay the interest on that loan, are you paying the interest to yourself too? No, the, the interest gets paid back to the insurance company. So okay. the, the insurance company, basically you're borrowing, they're loaning you the money against your right. policy, right? So technically you're borrowing from yourself and you're paying interest back on that money. But as I said, you know, is if I if I borrow at four and I can make 10, I capture a six point spread. So right. I'm, right. I'm, a, I'm completely okay with that. Or okay. I can borrow, I can borrow against it and the loan rate is lower than the growth rate. Yeah. Depending yeah. on how I'm invested. Oh. So, okay, so a, we'll, we'll, we'll video. yeah, we'll do we'll do a video or, or a, a video just dedicated to this with Q and A too, so we can. I'm sure folks will have a lot of other questions too. But let real, um, real quick, real quick before you jump off though, this is this is one of those things. And again, when we go back to talking about you know Dave Ramsey, he's like just buy term and invest the difference. The problem is nobody ever invests the difference, right? They buy term, they don't invest the difference, they wind up with no insurance and broke at retirement. So you know. These all the these these kind of axioms sound great, and whole life you know permanent life insurance policies is not for everybody. You know if you don't have the ability to oversave for the account, don't do a permanent life because you will spend too much money on insurance just to be insured. Go buy term and get your house in order so you can start saving more money. But this is why you need guys like Danny and Richard that can look at your financial situation and tell you if it's a good investment or not. And, and if it's worthwhile doing, because again, as we talked about before, even with annuities, annuities are a great vehicle to in, ensure and secure your retirement, but not for everyone. Great. All right. Look, well, quickly before we move off here, it seems like, Lance, you have given our younger viewers something to really look into. You've given our older viewers who have kids, you know, maybe going, entering into adulthood to say, hey, look, you really should start this sooner, which is great. You sort of lamented you didn't start this younger in life. At what age does it not make sense to do this? In other words, can a 40 year old still take advantage of this? Can a 60 year old? What year does it begin to become not so useful? Uh, you want me to take that? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think you have to be careful because when you're young, 
you're you're sort of starving for cash flow, right? So, so one you of can't the biggest overfund. Issues, yeah. Yeah. So you can't, and and the premiums are going to be. If I want to get a million dollar permanent life insurance policy compared to a term policy, term policy is so much cheaper, right? There's going to be an, a level of necessity that a lot of people that take out permanent life insurance policies, they can't make the premiums and they fail. So you got to get to the level where you can have the cash flow coming in. And, and Lance brought up an excellent point. You go through the hierarchy of savings. I, I am now uh, in my maybe my early 40s. I, have, I still have people that I want life insurance for. I max out everything, but I still have extra cash. What else can I do with it? That's where the permanent life insurance, I know I can make the premiums. Not only that, I can overfund to invest the difference in that in the buckets. So you want to make sure you have enough household cash flow because you don't want to forsake insurance, especially if you have a young family. Yeah. So there's and, a point where term works. Yeah. And, and Richard, you know, that's a that's a crucially important point to all this. And again, this is why, you know, again, we could spend another two hours talking about this easy. But this is a commitment. When you do whole life insurance or permanent insurance, it's it's a marriage. And you're committing to this for 10 to 20 years, because if you stop funding it, you know, in five years, you, you know, you funded it for five years, you're doing great. Then something happens and you say, well, I don't want to fund it anymore. It, it completely fun, kind of falls apart because now that the, they're going to start going into your cash to pay it, to pay the premiums on the insurance. So or you've got to cancel the policy. Right. So this is a long term commitment. You've got to be when when I started my policy, I was probably in my early 40s. And I had to commit to that. And I knew that that was after I funded everything else that even came before my mortgage. So, you know, you have to commit to this before everything else. Otherwise, it won't work. And, and this is, again, this is why it goes back to the financial planning. This isn't something you can do or this is not something you do if you can just barely make this happen. And any type of downturn in your lifestyle, a loss of a job or whatever is going to disrupt that plan. Don't do it because it will completely backfire on you. Okay, I'm gonna move on from this just so we don't make this just the uh, permanent life insurance uh, <laughs> Q&A, uh, but, uh, but fantastic uh, points, guys. Um, all right, uh, very high level question here, which is um, what does a retirement planning session look like, right? So somebody says, hey, I watched the video, it was great, I wanna go do this. Um, is it just a session with you guys? Is it a series of sessions over time? Do they have to be an RAA client? To have their portfolio managed or can they just contract with you guys for a plan um what does the experience look like generally uh we provide this to assets under management clients um and the plan is free we do the plan because to lance's point it all works together uh and a retirement planning session is is partnership along with the uh what we do from a money management perspective in other words this is an ongoing kind of process where there's a lot of work up front. There's also a lot of self-awareness that an individual needs to go through to understand and crystallize what are exactly are my needs? What are my wants? What are the things that pie in the sky wishes? And then we're going to try to figure out how do we make all this happen for you? So even people in their, in their 20s and 30s can at least start looking at a plan and a process. So it's not a one-time thing. It's not a session. It's an ongoing process of what is the goals you're trying to hit? What can deviate you from that? Changes in your life that have to be incorporated into the plan. And then what exactly, what kind of return do you need to hit the goals you have? There are some people we meet with, Danny and I, that we try to figure out, well, you all need a 10% rate of return to get to these goals. And where are you going to get it? Because we, we can help, but we can't work magic on the portfolio side, right? So part of that's an investment of what you're going to do. Are you going to grow your earnings? Are you going to save more? Are you going to work longer? What are you going to do? So this whole financial awareness is not a session. It's ongoing relationship uh, with us as part of RIA. Yeah, and I think that's a key point, too, because, you know, Adam, to your, your point is, is that, you know, this is normally what we do with our with our clients that we're managing money for and and this you know i'm the portfolio manager that's my team that i work with michael Leibowitz, nick lane myself you know what we do is we run the portfolio what what richard and danny do is they work with the clients and so these financial plans are very detailed and look you you can go get a financial plan anywhere and uh, and richard made this comment earlier in in the video talking about 
or I'm sorry, it was Danny talking about how most people get a financial plan and they get this nice little binder and it has all their stuff in it. And they look at it for a lot, two seconds, they put it up on a shelf and they never look at it again. And if that's, you know, if that's what you're wanting a financial plan for, that's great. And it's not going to do you any good. Right. What we do with financial plans is, is, is Richard and Danny do the financial plan and determine like, like he just said, he says, okay, you need a 10% rate of return. Where are you going to get that? Um, but most of the time they're much more realistic and investing is not about beating some random benchmark index. If, if your goal is to beat the S and P 500 every year, you're going to wind up losing more money than you make over time. Your goal is to beat an inflation or what we call a hurdle rate, which is you need 3% to reach your financial goal intact. And, and so they run the plan. The plan says you need a 3% growth rate. We build a portfolio. Me and my team, we build a portfolio to deliver that 3% rate of return without taking on excess risk. We talked about this in one of our previous videos. If you, if I say, you know, Adam, you need 3%. You go, yeah, but Lance, I, I really want four. Okay, it's just 1%, right? It's just, but that's a 25% increase from three to four. I've got to increase my return by 25%, but it takes more than a hundred percent increase in the amount of risk I take to generate that 1% additional rate of return, which means that in the event of a market downturn, I lose more money. Right. And so what these plans do is align that portfolio management with the financial plan. And then every year they do this plan again. What's changed? Is the environment changed? Has the market crashed? Has you have you lost your job? Have you had 12 kids? You know, whatever it is, what's changed? And then we adjust that plan. And if necessary, we adjust the portfolio. So this is something and, and it's, it's like a road. And, and if this financial plan is a roadmap and you have to follow it. You've got to do your job. Adam, you said you were going to save twenty five thousand dollars a year. OK, did you do that last year? No, you didn't. You only saved 20,000. Okay, where are we going to get the other five now? You know, are you oversaved? Good job, right? That just helps the whole thing. But this is a responsibility between the client and us as the advisors and the portfolio managers. We both have our jobs to do. And this is what we use to hold people accountable, both ourselves, our advisors, as well as our clients to make sure they meet their goals. Great. Yeah. I mean, it sort of sounds like what you're saying this is a partnership and the plan is almost like the contract. It okay. is. This is what I agree. I'm going to do as the client. This is what you agree you're going to do as the advisor. And every year we're going to check in on this and, you know, make audible calls, uh, given what what's happening in the world. That's right. Um, all right. I'd love to keep digging on this stuff. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to rapid fire through a couple more here and try to squeeze a few more in before we run out of time. Um, somebody asked about uh, an interesting question, which is, um, hey, the, the HELOC, you know, market has kind of died right now. Um, if we want to get some money out of our homes, what are our options right now? <laughs> well, you can re you can do a, you can do a home equity cash out. I mean, those are still running right now. I'm not sure why you want to cash out at these levels, but um, you know, you know, it's a couple of things. I, you know, people do a lot of bad things with their houses. Um, <laughs> you know, one of those is they pay off their mortgage going into retirement. You know, when your rate is two or three percent, don't pay off. Don't worry about paying off your mortgage, right? You're, once you put all your money into your house, you know, you've got a million dollar house. That's great. I've got a million dollar asset sitting there. It's generating no income for your retirement. There's nothing wrong with debt if you can control the debt and, and control your payments, et cetera. So if your payment is 3%, you know, 3% interest, keep a mortgage. Who cares? Invest the difference, let it grow for you, and then pay that mortgage off, off over time. It's one of the last few tax deductions you get anyway on the mortgage interest. So you know, there's, you know, HELOCs are great. If you really need to tap capital out of your house, that's great. But don't go take a home equity loan to go invest in the stock market. If you take equity out of your house, which is a fixed rate of return, the only thing you invest in is something that has a guaranteed return to principal and a fixed rate of return that's higher than what you're borrowing at. And you can't get that today. Yeah. You know, Adam, it's uh, interesting because uh, many people, that's where, listen, where is most people's wealth? It's in their homes. Right. There are so many times most talk, American households, at least, their largest asset is their house. There's still, what's, I don't know, Lance will probably know the number, but what is the actual home equity worth, wealth of the United States? So a lot of people also don't want to move as they get older. They want to age in place, as we said in the presentation. So uh, listen, the reverse mortgage, or the reverse mortgage line of credit, once you turn 62, you don't have to tap that money right away. You can sit on that line of credit and let it grow uh, with along with your home 
and then tap it for income and or tap it for long-term care expenses and so forth. So it's a way to get some liquidity out of your home. Some people will just outright downsize, I will tell you, in retirement. They'll go smaller. But ironically, there's some clients we have, they go bigger in retirement. Well, I need a bigger house. I'm like, why do you need a bigger house? We need a smaller house. Um, but reverse mortgages are not what they were. They have changed a lot. So these are lines of credit, mm -hmm. except on a home that you are planning or you and your spouse are planning to stay in. Um, yeah, your kids it, don't want your your kids don't want your house. No, not at all. And we could be real boring right. about this, Adam. I mean, this is what yeah. we do with the financial plan. We're going to do scenarios and say, okay, what if you pay the house off? What does it look like? You're coming out of X to pay this off, or what if you don't? And so we can look at side by side comparisons and see what works best for you over the longevity of your financial plan. But like Rich yeah. mentioned, you know, the the reverse mortgage that used to be almost predatorial. Um, in, in a lot of ways, but they've gotten so much better. This is one area. I'm not for big regulations. Um, they've actually done a really good job of educating people much better. So it's, it's lower a cost. much better tool in the toolbox. Yeah. yeah, it really is. It's much lower cost than it was. And listen, a lot of the stuff that we saw with reverse mortgage nightmares in the past is people doing what they did with home equity lines of credit. They took out the money and they went on vacations. They, 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 they bought junk they didn't need. So you got to be fiscally responsible fiscally responsible for whether it's a HELOC or it's Look, a- uh, every, Everybody needs a private jet, okay? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, or a tiny house, that's all you need. Tiny house and an acre of land, that's all you ever need. All right. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, this is a big topic. So let's just get a, you know, your kind of quick high level thoughts on it. But um, what do you guys see as like the roles of, of trusts playing here. In other words, you know, there's a school of thought that says, hey, you know, put all your assets into trust. Have you as an individual look like you basically own nothing? Um, in fact, that might help you qualify for lots of things, but the trust is actually there paying for, you know, all, all your, the things that you want to do in life. I think so, we're all going to have a lot of different yeah. topics and conversations <laughs> surrounding this. I think trust can be great when used properly. The problem is a lot of times, they get overused in many ways because you go to the attorney, your grandson, your son, or somebody says, Hey guys, you got to put all your money in a trust. Well, that's not always the case for most people. So sometimes it can start to add up in cost. The attorneys typically aren't going to say no, they want to collect the fees. So heck yeah, you need a trust, but trusts are great for, for many different reasons. And depending on the amount of wealth you have, they can be a great tool as well. And so I think that, you know, we need to make sure that we really understand what a trust does. And so for most of our clients, we're looking at trust because we want to be able to, or they want to be able to control the assets at, you know, beyond the, the grave, essentially. And so when you pass, you can dictate, you know, my kids, if I pass, my wife passes, the funds go into a trust. And then at that point, you know, the kids go somewhere. Rich is going to take care of uh, being the trustee. I hope you remember that, right, buddy? Um, and, and essentially... What will happen is they're going to have a, a kind of a, a seasoning period where they're going to start learning about, OK, this is what happens in a meeting. This is what how you manage finances. Here's what we do. And they get that education around it. And then they at some point they as they age and hopefully mature, they come in and they, they are able to manage those funds themselves. Um, trust can also be a tool for you know protecting assets. So we see that used often. Um, you know, as people accumulate wealth, they can be a great tool in that regard. And I think that that's where most people are thinking about using them, getting it out of their name, making sure that funds go directly where they want them to go and how they want them to go to that specific reason or purpose or person for that matter. Yeah. Well, one, yes. one, one caveat to that that's super important is that in the one, the only thing you put into trust are things that can't injure people. And in other words, do not put your house that you live in inside of your trust. Because if Danny comes over to my house, slips and falls and breaks a leg, he sues the trust because that's where the home ownership of the house is. And he's right into the trust. He gets everything that's there. So the only thing that goes into your trust account are things like cash, securities, things that can't hurt people. You know, if you want to put, you know, your, your gold ETF in there, right? But if you have a big stack of gold at home in a closet, don't put it inside your trust because somebody opens the closet door, all the gold falls on and kills them. 
they're in the trust, right? So, you know, you have to be careful. They're, they are not the be all end all of asset protection. And there are ways to get into a trust if you're not careful. Yeah. And I was picking on attorneys a little bit. I mean, this is something, obviously, we're not attorneys. You need to visit. Yeah, no, we're not attorneys. It, but Adam, to your point, trusts can get overused when they sound sexy, uh, but they are for specific functions. For example, say the estate tax exemption, we have to worry about taxes going higher. If the estate tax exemptions go down and you want to preserve them, yes, bypass trusts will work. You have children that need our special needs. You want to make sure they're, they're taken care of after you're gone. <clears throat> trusts work. To Danny's point, <clears throat> I want to make sure my money stays in my family. I just had a recent uh, example. I've been working for this with this couple for 25 years. Now I'm working with the children. And one of the children got divorced. But since we set up these, these, these trusts early on and the parents have passed, now they're getting divorced. And I told uh, the, 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 the young lady I work with, nope, it's protected against the divorce. It doesn't count. <clears throat> so... Trust can be used in a very modular sense, very direct sense. People use revocable living trusts to avoid probate, but that depends on the state you're in. Texas probate costs aren't that onerous. If I'm in New York, in New Jersey, I probably want a revocable living trust for privacy and to expedite, uh, for an ex expedite my probate process. <clears throat> it's all part of the planning process. Um, and then people have spend down trusts for Medicaid. And I'm like, if you have the money and you want your parents to be in Medicaid, then you don't really like them very much. No way. You know, yeah. they're, 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 you know, it's if they have the money to take care of themselves, let them do that. But there are trusts that that are spend down trusts for Medicaid purposes as well. So they're very specific, and you got to do the planning and work with your estate planning attorney to make sure they're right. All right, great. Well, as I said, big topic. I, I think this is well. I, I know Lance and I have chatted a little about this estate planning topic, and one of our past. Uh, uh, weekend uh, rants a uh, month or two ago and folks said, hey, that's a topic I'd love to see a webinar on. So we'll probably do one on that at some point. And folks, if you're interested in that, just let us know in the comments. Again, we, we listen to what you want us to do. Um, all right. So let's see here. Um, can any one of these could be a webinar. Um, are there any best practices that you guys uh, may want to share in terms of when to bring your adult children into um, the picture here in terms of, okay, we're getting older. Um, uh, you know, w when do you want to pass the torch in terms of having them manage the majority of the, your financial life as you're getting older, right? Is, are there any key milestones besides just age or health? No, I, don't want my kids, one. I don't want my kids managing my estate. I don't want my, in other words, there's two, there's two questions here. One is, when do I bring the kids into this conversation? As soon as possible, because the later you wait, the more conflict you're going to create in the family once you're gone. Yep. Without the, you don't want an estate planning document, a cold, hard document or book to speak for you. So opening up a conversation with your adult children and bringing your, an intermediary in to make it easier, like your financial partner or your tax specialist or whoever it is, to get that working can be very, very um, helpful uh, overall. There are children who will manage some of the day-to-day -day stuff as their parents are aging in place, uh, whether it's checkbook, making sure that they're, they can sign on an account. There are things when the children are finally brought in, when there's some limitation that we're seeing or mom and dad are seeing in themselves that make them realize, I might need a little help from time to time. Uh, yeah. But that's just depending on the health and the, of, of the individuals that we work with. But you always want your kids to have these open conversations yeah. with your children about everything. Go Communication ahead. Is key. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, and, and look, and, and it's true. I think, you, you know, we have lots of conversations with my kids about, you know, you know, where we are, where we're headed, what our goals are. But our kids will never have access to our trust. And, and the reason is, is because I, I tell you, I've been doing this for over 35 years. And the one thing that destroys families more than anything else is when somebody, the parents, you know, the, the matriarch, the patriarch passes away and there's a huge fight over the assets, right? It's just, and I've seen family after family after family just destroyed over because Jimmy didn't get as much as Johnny and Jenny got more than, than Jimmy. And, and it's just, you know, it's just the whole greed thing comes in. 
you know, so, so what a trust is when you set it up, it is your wishes of what happens with your money after you pass away. And you can define everything you want inside that trust. I think one of the shortfalls I see in a lot of trusts is that, you know, lawyers, they do kind of a lot of boilerplate stuff. And I'm not poo-pooing lawyers. It's just, you know, they, there's kind of some standard things that are put in, in most trust. And they say, well, at the age of 35, the kids get access to one third of the, the amount. And then at 40, they get another access to some more. And then at 45 or whatever, they get access to everything. Um, Personally, at 35, I was not financially responsible. <laughs> and I don't think most kids are because we haven't raised and, and, and we can just take a look at kind of the financial statistics of America. You know, 80 percent of Americans can't come up with 500 bucks. We have not raised a generation of financially responsible children. So my kids, as an example, I'm just using this example in our trust. It says that our kids have to have a college education they have to be working full time and they have to pass a drug test at the discretion of the trustee, which will be a bank or a major firm or, you know, Danny or Richard or somebody. Right. It'll be somebody I trust that will oversee the trust. And as long as they are adhering to being good, responsible citizens, they can withdraw four percent of the trust on an annual basis. They will never be able to touch the corpus of the of, of the of the amount. They'll never touch the principal. They will only withdraw the, the interest that it generates. And the reason for that is, and Danny Ritchell will attest to this, the vast majority of wealth created by a family never survives the first generation because the kids go off, they get married, they get divorced, there goes half the money. Um, you know, they go invest in worm farms and, you know, bicycle, electric bicycle farms or whatever, there goes the money. And so it never survives. And so what a trust is there for is to create a legacy generation of money for not just your kids, but your kids' kids, their kids, the kids after that. And so if you set it up properly and run it properly, it will last for generations. This is why the Rockefellers have so much money. This is why Ben Franklin's money is still here. Ben Franklin's money was never to be invested in anything but treasuries, right? So it just paid an interest income stream. That's all. Well, um, but that money that's just a really good point. Yeah, the money just compounds over time. But that's why the wealth that those families have created is because the kids never had access to it. Well, and the other that's point a great here. point. And Danny, Dan, I'm going to let you go in a second and respond yeah. to that. Um, I do want to flag uh, that is great fodder for, for the additional estate planning one we're going to do. Um, and feel free, like I said, to have any comments on what Lance said. My, my question, and, and I just before we leave it, I want to give you a chance to speak directly to it, is more about you're still alive, right? Sort of like what Rich was saying is, is you're getting to a point where, uh, A, maybe you want the kids to start getting some you know, practice managing the assets because they're going to take them over eventually, but also, you know, quality of life or just your own capabilities. No, you may no, not no. want to be doing all the details or, or maybe no, you, you can't. You, mis you misunderstood me. My kids will never manage the assets. No, I know. Cause your kids are the Taliban. You tell me that. <laughs> exactly. <everywhere. laughs> so no, there will be a professional that does this for a living that will manage the assets. They will be engineers and doctors and lawyers and they will do their job and they will do what they do well and they will create their life, but they will never manage the assets. Okay. But, and, yeah, and, but, and, and again, it doesn't necessarily have to be the financial assets. The spirit is more sort of yeah. like, help you with the mortgage payments, help you, you know, is, 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 is there any, again, best practice you, you have in just terms of making that graceful transition from I'm doing everything as the parent to, okay, you guys are beginning to take over as the, the alpha in the family. I, I think sometimes too, parents are re reluctant to bring this up to their kids. So actually the kids have to approach this topic carefully. Um, sort of it, sometimes the best conversations I've had with children and their parents is when the children have done something from an estate planning perspective or a check signing perspective, you know, mom and dad, even if I get disabled, I'm 35, someone else can sign my check. Um, uh, we go through each other's bank statements. In other words, they make the parents sort of feel like, why are we doing it um, overall? And um, the, so that kind of communication among the family allows that kind of interaction to occur. Um, we especially see it happen when we have parents that are moving from assist from uh, aging in place to assisted, to assisted living. Assisted living. Mm -hmm. Kids are more engaged at that point to say, okay, I want to be the gatekeeper. I want to make sure that mama is taken care of. Uh, I want to look through her checks. It's a job. 
for a lot of these uh, children. It teaches them how much they need to do for long-term care and assisted living when they're helping their parents. Matter of fact, someone on the on our webinar just brought it up that they were having end-of-life conversations and issues, which would be a great topic for. Um, yeah. By, uh, by the way, webinar. before we before we jump off this topic and then we go to something else, yeah. if you know everybody listening to this video today. The first thing you should do after you get off this video is go online and do a basic will. Yep. Um, and then the second thing you do is write a love letter to your family saying, look, if anything happens to me, here's where you're going to find all the important documents. Here's our lawyer's name. Here's our, 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 our advisor's name, Danny Ratliff and Richard Rosso. You know, here's all of our bank accounts. Here's, you know, where all these things are and have this stuff organized somewhere in your house where it is easy to find. I had to go through a, a, a mess with a, fa a family friend and, you know, it is not fun at all trying to piece together somebody's life after they leave and trying to hunt down all these assets and trying to figure out where everything is and all the legal issues and trying to cancel this and cancel that. Make it easy on your family. It doesn't take a lot of time. Get a will. A basic will will solve a lot of problems in every state in the country. Uh, but, you know, write this love letter, organize your files and, and put those in a place where they're easy to find. And then it's done. You'll spend a weekend doing this. It'll be it'll be over with. And your family will benefit greatly from it. All right. Dan, 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 I'm, I'm going to give the last word on this before we go to, to one more uh, topic. But real well, one quick. thing I want to let, I let you all know, yeah. and Daniel also knows about this site, fivewishes.org. The word fivewishes.org. You can get a little booklet that will help you formulate what Lance just brought up. It's a wonderful organization. Read through it. Order a booklet for five bucks. Go through it. what you want said at your funeral, who would handle things for you, end of life issues. But it allows you to start the framework that Lance is talking about. It's a wonderful yeah. site. Great. I, I, just, I just posted that in the uh, in the chat here. So, Dan, I'm going to give you the torch, but, but real quick, um, you guys are exactly right, which is when somebody dies without a plan and the family has to play the forensic archaeologist and everybody's warring with each other, it's a total nightmare, could easily be uh, avoided with some pre-planning. I think there's an analogy, though, to when families have to start making those transitions while everybody's still alive of, oh, my gosh, mom and dad really can't take care of themselves anymore or whatever. Again, and I'm, I'm, I'm maybe I'm drilling on this because I've gone through this personally with my family where there was no planning up until we all just slammed together into that problem. And if we had, you know, sort of over the years planned for it, talked about it, you know, kind of come up with some rules of engagement and what folks wanted and whatnot, it would have been so much easier, right? So anyways, Danny, I'll let you finish here. Well, these are the things that nobody wants to deal with. Nobody wants to think about, I need life insurance. Nobody wants to think about, I need a trust or a will or a power of attorney because I'm, I'm gonna live forever, right? And so to tie it all up, though, Adam, I think that, you know, like Lance said, you need a basic will. You need power of attorney on you and your spouse. So you're incapacitated. It's a durable power of attorney. You're out of you're out of the country for work. You're traveling. Your spouse needs to do something on your behalf. They can do so. But a great way to start having these conversations as well is get a instead of just a durable, maybe get because I know a lot of times people are probably a little apprehensive to discuss this with children. And get a springing power of attorney. So let's say that you and your spouse are both in a car wreck. Something bad happens that now, because you're incapacitated, your children have the ability to go in to pay your bills, to get into your bank account, to help with these things. And so I think you can have this conversation, you know, at a probably a much earlier age when they feel you feel like they're capable to do these things. But a good estate attorney is going to help walk you through this. That five wishes that, that Rich mentioned is fantastic because it, it gets you to begin thinking about these things that are really so important. And we visit with people all the time. And a lot of times they, they want to put the cart way before the horse. We say, guys, you need to address this now. This estate planning is so important. Let's get this done, knock this out. Then let's start working on the plan as we go. And so um, I think that having these conversations while children are younger, and like you mentioned, when you go through it, that's usually when it begins, you start thinking about this is that, oh, shoot, we just did this. That's when everybody wants long-term care. When they actually see their parents go through these scenarios, everybody's like, oh my goodness, I need long-term care. Well, a lot of times you're in your 60s and 70s, and maybe it's not nearly as affordable as it would have been 
had you been younger. So having these conversations at a very young age or, or much younger age than you think you need it is really probably the best practice. All right, great point. We, we just had a, a wonderful best practice suggested by Guy here in the comments, which is make sure a trusted friend after you die runs to your house and deletes all your Google searches. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you don't if you don't have that trusted friend, you need to get one now. Yeah, oh, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, look, there's so many more questions. We're not going to have time to get to it. I do have a couple critical resources to uh, share with folks. So folks stick around for the next few minutes to hear them. Um, but but this is a good question to end on, which is, um, you know, uh, there's there's the focus on minimizing your cost footprint in retirement, right? Because that that you know gives you maximum defense against inflation and whatnot, right? The the, the less you need to live on, the 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 better, right? Um, then you guys talked about the important advantages of of you know working longer or strategies that you can do that can really kind of goose the money coming in, right? Um, both of those are really good, but but when it comes down to it, what what drives happiness and quality of life in retirement, right? You know, should people be maniacally focusing on trying to get the ma absolute maximum payment out of X, Y, or Z, or in your guys's practice, is 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 having enough enough? Right, and then you you get your happiness out of other things in retirement, um, or does more money always correspond with more happiness in your twilight years? Let, uh, let me let me start on that. I know Richard and Danny will jump in as well. Look, you know what? You know it's always interesting because we equate everything in in the world, especially in the world of finance, to how much money can I get in retirement? Right? I, you know, I need five million dollars. I need ten million dollars. Look, I've got friends of mine that have. $200,000 in the bank and they're as happy as they can be, right? Because their cost of living is not that much and they have everything they want. And, and happiness is very subjective where, you know, it is really just a function of, you know, having enough money to live the lifestyle you want. You know, there's, there's, you know, it always kind of fascinates me. People go, well, money doesn't buy happiness, right? And that's true. Money doesn't buy happiness, but it buys a whole lot of whatever comes in second. And if I'm not having to stress about money, it leaves me more time to focus on whatever it is that makes me happy, whether it's playing golf or tennis or taking trips or whatever it is. And everybody's lifestyle wishes of being happy is different. Richard's is different than mine. Mine's different than Danny's. And, you know, everybody's is different. We all have different aspirations in life. And so the whole goal of investing in savings is, is to create enough wealth that the income stream it can generate can buy a whole lot of whatever comes in second to being happy. Yeah, Good the answer. financial media does a really poor job because we see all these commercials and it says, what's your number? What do you need to retire? So we so focus on this big number. And it's a lot of times people are like, you know, it's like Rome wasn't built in a day. It's bite-sized chunks. It's good habits, a little bit at a time. And, you know, I've told people with, half a million dollars that they can retire. I've told people with um, 15 million that they can't. And so it really depends on what your goals are. I, I think the happiest people though, and, and Rich can can probably, uh, he, he can say the same, is that it's when you have a plan. And we talk a lot about qualitative things and, and when we're doing plans. And I think that's so overlooked because it's like I, I gave the analogy, my, my son goes to play t-ball, he practices, he practices. We don't ever practice for retirement. And so we talked about the crossover risk that many people get either sometimes a rug's pulled out from under us. We have a health issue. We lose our job. Something happens. And, you know, we're we're in retirement much earlier than we anticipate. But historically, the people who say, look, here's how I'm going to keep my sense of purpose. Here's how I'm going to remain social. Here's how what I what I envision retirement to be, regardless of the money. Those guys are generally very successful in retirement because they know what they're what their purpose is and you know what they're what they want to get out of life. And I think that is the key is starting to have those conversations with your wife. Hey, are you going to pick up an old hobby? Uh, what do you do together? What do you do on your own? Um, you know, those are all vital conversations I think that need to be had. All right, Rich, you want to back clean up here? Yeah. Um, it's just a tough one only because um, there's a qualitative, there's a qualitative self-assessment you need to do to understand what that what retirement, what security means to you, right? Because it's not all money. It's health, right? It's these qualitative things because if you just go by numbers, there's a point in retirement 
Uh, David Blanchett used to work for Morningstar, great planner, talked about the retirement smile. When I'm active, I have an active retirement, and then all of a sudden I, I have this sort of well of where I'm not really spending a lot of money, but I'm not unhappy. I'm not, un, I'm not unhealthy, but I'm not traveling as much, right? My, my needs are smaller. And then, of course, as we age, then health care costs come up. So this wedge this where you live in this wedge, most of your time outside of the ends of your smile, if like the joker, right? You're right in the middle. It's qualitative. It's qualitative. It's it's spending time with people you care about. And, and this is where planners, we stink at this because it's always about numbers. I mean, we, we have to help people understand what's your motivation. What's going to keep you up at night? Most of the time, it's the risk mitigation issues. It's the vulnerability, the physical vulnerabilities, uh, and how we can mitigate those issues, the long-term care issues. And I want my health is the most important thing. When we have people that want to cut, like recently, we have people going through their budgets, right? They're micro-budgeting. Oh, I'm going to cut the gym membership. I'm like, no, you're not. You're not cutting the gym membership. Matter of fact, we're going to increase the amount you're paying at the gym, and you're going to go. Because we know the health and wealth equation. I think Danny and Lance especially knows if I'm not healthy in retirement, nothing matters. So I have to get people to list their top five qualitative elements of retirement. What are they looking for? Forget the money. Take the cash out. What is most important? Family, health, security, you know, those kinds of things. That's the tough part. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, well, I'm so glad to hear you say it that way. And part of this why I ask is if you if you go to Google and you type in, you know, centarian advice, um, you get these interviews of people who talk to people who live beyond 100 years old. And they ask them, you know, what what mattered to you in your life? And nobody ever says, oh, I made this much money or whatever. It's always about the relationships or it's about meaning. Right. And so, you know, I love the fact that you guys have that qualitative exercise. You bring people through that says because somebody here and I think they probably maybe said it with a little bit of a sarcasm, but they said, you need FU money. And not everybody's gonna retire with FU money. And you don't wanna give the message that, hey, if you don't, you're screwed in retirement, right? It's you wanna strive to have at least enough, but then really focus on the things that are gonna bring you happiness. Because at the end of the day, that's what you measure your, yeah. your life and it, by. And uh, that's, what, that's what I meant by, you know, money buys whatever comes in second, because everything that Richard talked about, family, friends, um, you know, doing charity work, whatever it is that gives you fulfillment and happiness, the money provides you the ability to do that. If you're, if you're, if you, if you're so stressed out about just trying to pay bills, and this is where it goes back to having an annuity to pay those basic expenses in retirement along with your social security. So you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So you can go do these things that make you happy. If you're stressing out over money, you're never going to be happy. That's why finances are the number two reason people get divorced right next to infidelity. And I guarantee if you're having financial problems, you're probably being, inf you know, having infidelity because those tend to go hand in hand. What's financial infidelity? It is Yeah. And, you know, this. And so that's what I'm saying is and, and to, to the point here is that money buys you whatever comes in second to happiness because the money gives you the ability to be happy. And, and that's why it is so important. And that's why we do focus on these goals and, and, and these aspirations saying, what do you want? If your goal is just to do charity work, you may only need a few hundred thousand in the bank to do that. If you want to fly private jets, we have clients that do that. They want to fly private jets everywhere in the world because they don't like commercial airlines anymore. Great. You're going to need a lot of money to do that. But, you know, that's if that's what makes you happy, more power to you. Right. And that's yeah, it. There's nothing it is. wrong with any of that. Your life's a movie. Snapshot it and think about, tell people, what's the most important thing? Paint me a picture of what's most important to you in retirement. What do you visualize yourself doing? And I had a woman who's 75 years old and she said, sitting on the patio with a blueberry muffin and a coffee, watching my grandson play. That was it. Don't need a lot for that. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But I get a lot from it. But I get a lot from it. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, excellent, guys. Well, look, this has been a phenomenal uh, webinar. Um, everybody, if you can, thank the, our, our, our gracious uh, hosts and, uh, and experts here in the comment section. Um, I've got uh, two key things to let you know about. So one is I'm already seeing the questions come through. All right. Look, um, how do I talk to these guys? Um, you know, I, I, I want to start developing a good retirement plan. Right. So um, to schedule a free consultation, go to wealthion.com. Now that's the form that we have that'll connect you, you know, ask you a few questions. It'll connect you with the financial advisor 
that you know our, our uh, algorithm deems best based upon what you've told us. But you have the ability to override that if you want and just say, I just I, I want to talk to the guys at, at RIA. Um, so if that's indeed true, just click that. It'll send you directly through the system. You'll get a call from these guys very quickly looking to schedule um, an initial outreach. And again, those initial outreaches are free. They'll sit down, they'll hear what you want to do, they'll give you their advice, and then you can determine if you want to you know, continue on with them. So make sure if you have an interest in this and you haven't yet talked to these guys, go to Wealthion.com right now, fill out that short little form, takes you literally like 30 seconds, you'll be off to the races on that. Um, and uh, you can see I'm still learning how to use this, this little system here. So I'm going to put up my next fancy banner, which is... Um, uh, we've talked a lot about retirement planning right now, which is, you know, in terms of the contract with the advisor, a lot of what you're going to do in terms of how you're going to allocate your money, you know, when you're going to enroll for Medicare, how you're going to talk to your kids and all that type of stuff. In terms of the other side of the equation, which is, OK, how does the advisor take the money you've entrusted with them and grow that responsibly? Well, you really have to understand what's happening in the macro situation and figure out, you know, OK, what type of investing plan am I going to put put together for the macro strategy? So next month, as you've likely been hearing me talk on this channel, uh, we're having Wealthion's annual fall conference. Uh, it happens online. Uh, we have an unbelievable lineup for that, including Lance, of course. Um, but we're going to have you know folks like federal former Federal Reserve uh, senior Federal Reserve economist Lacey Hunt, who will be talking about where he sees Fed policy going. We'll have Lynn Alden talking about uh, her market outlook. We'll have Matt Taibbi, uh, famed journalist, uh, talking about this the same type of Wall Street uh, and media abuses that he saw leading up to the 2008 crisis. We'll have Grant Williams, Stephanie Pomboy talking about uh, what's going to likely happen with inflation. What's going to dominate from here? Is it going to be stagflation, disinflation, inflation, deflation? Uh, we'll have Alf Pecatiello talking about the bond market. We're going to have Doomberg talking about uh, our energy crisis situation. We'll have Nick uh, Jurley back on talking more about the housing market uh, correction that we're seeing happen in real time. Uh, we're going to have hard assets specialist Rick Rule. Uh, we're going to have folks talking about precious metals, uh, mining stocks. I mean, it's really going to be a phenomenal um, event. So if you haven't yet, oh, I haven't. Uh, Shoot. Oh, there we go. Sorry. That's that's the link right there. If you haven't yet registered for that conference, go to Wealthion.com slash conference. And one of the reasons why I'm, I'm pushing it so hard right now is we're now uh, a week away from the expiry of the early bird price discount, which is about 30 percent. So I want to make sure everybody who's interested in that gets that 30 percent discount while they can. So to do that again, just go to Wealthion.com slash conference. Um, all right. So, folks, again, um, just in parting here in the chat, let us know if you would like us to continue doing more theme based webinars like this. Uh, and if the answer is yes, if you have a theme that you'd like us uh, to focus on for one of the next ones, do me a favor. Just put it in the comments section below. We're, we watch all that stuff really closely. I'll recap with Lance and the guys here uh, to see which of the topics you guys care most about that they could help us put together a similar presentation like this next. Um, Lance, uh, Danny, Rich, I just wanna thank you guys so much. Any any parting bits of words from you guys for the audience here? We'll start with you, Lance. <laughs> no, I'm pretty much no. <laughs> so, okay. I, I, look, we appreciate the opportunity to, we're very passionate about what we do. Um, we really value our clients very much. And, and, you know, we all, we, we, we generally just, I mean, if, if we could do our job for free, I'm sure Danny and Richard would agree we would do it for free um, because we just love what we do. And we appreciate the opportunity to, you know, to, to work with people every day. It's, it's a blessing. All right, Rich, Danny, let's, let's go with you. Um, I just hope you were able to take one bit of information here in this workshop and put it to use. That's all I ask. Uh, something that you were told that really is dogma and it doesn't make any sense. We try to be somewhat unconventional, but if conventional works, we, we look at it. We're students of, of, of planning and uh, we hope that you got good information from this uh, presentation that if you can't use, maybe somebody in your family can as well. So we really appreciate you spending all the time with us today. That's a great point, Rich. Yes, if you have people in your family who you think this would benefit, literally, guys, just copy the YouTube URL, email it off to them. Danny, you get the last word here, my friend. 
Oh man. All right. Big shoes to follow. So no, you know, these guys have really said it all. I mean, we, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys and just, you know, hear what's important to you. And I think we gained so much from that as well in the sense that understanding, you know, what are people struggling with and, you know, taking these big picture things and trying to really kind of hone in on them is so important. And all of these things, I know that there's so many puzzle pieces and putting them all together is difficult, but that's what we're here to do is try to help you navigate all the things that are occurring, you know, grow wealth, protect wealth. How do you keep it more money in your pocket? Like we mentioned earlier, avoid paying more in taxes. These are so many, so, so many things that are, are just so important and crucial to the lifeblood of your financial plan and, you know, longevity. And so we appreciate the time. Like Rich said, hopefully you guys gained something from this. Uh, you have questions, you know, reach out to Adam. We'd love to, to answer any of them. And hopefully we can do some more events like this. Thanks, Adam, for having us. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. All right, guys. Well, look, if you'd like to see us do more of these type of things with these gents too, please again, support this channel before you log off here just by hitting the like button. And if you haven't yet, click the subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Uh, but most important, you know, we do these webinars to bring you information that is hopefully both valuable and actionable. I think these guys did a great job of delivering the valuable side of things. So let's now put it into action. Uh, if you are motivated to do so, go right now again to wealthion.com, fill out the form to schedule your free consultation with the team here at RIA. Thanks so much, uh, Lance, Danny, Rich, um, everybody else. Thanks so much for spending the past three hours with us. It was wonderful. We'll do this again. Thanks for watching.